I'd like to call this hearing, uh, hearing to order and to welcome our, our witnesses on our three panels and to welcome our guests uh, to this hearing. And I'd like to begin by reading the following observation that was made by someone recently, and it goes this way, and I quote, in the public's view, OSHA has been driven too often by numbers and rules, not by smart enforcement and results. Business complains about overzealous and burdensome rules. Many people see OSHA as an agency so enmeshed in its own red tape that it has lost sight of its own mission. And too often, a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach has treated conscientious employers no differently from those who put workers needly at risk. The source of this critique? The Chamber of Commerce? No. The National Federation of Independent Businesses? No. Newt Gingrich? No. This candid assessment comes from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, announcing the new OSHA reinventing work safety and health. This oversight hearing will examine OSHA's efforts to re-engineer worker safety standards and enforcement to meet the new realities of the 21st century workplace. Again, in OSHA's own words, we will look at, quote, the need for OSHA and the need for OSHA to change, end of quote. The need for national safety and health standards in the workplace is undisputed. Last year, more than 6,000 people died as a result of occupational injury, 6,000 people. That human tragedy demands a vigilant national response to the hazards of work. In purely economic terms, the skill and energy of the American worker have, never ma have made our economy the most productive in the world. That asset, asset is best protected and enhanced in a safe workplace. But the American workplace is changing and OSHA must change with it. In 1970, when the Occupational Health and Safety Act was enacted, U.S. non-agricultural employment stood at 71 million. Today, that workforce is almost twice as large, 114 million. In 1970, 33% of all non-farm jobs were in goods producing industries, including manufacturing and construction. By 1994, that percentage had fallen to 21%. In 1970, 67% of jobs were in service producing industries. Today, 79% or 90 million employees work in service industries. If it was ever true that OSHA could effectively inspect, monitor, and improve safety conditions at, at all the nation's workplace, it is not a valid operational premise today. Instead, new approaches are being explored to stimulate voluntary compliance by industry and to transform OSHA from cop to counselor, from prosecutor to partner. By targeting the most unsafe workplaces through programs like Maine 200, or working cooperatively with business and labor to address health and safety issues in the Voluntary Protection Program, OSHA says it is responding to the concerns of its customers and focusing on results. So we ask our witnesses to tell us how the reinvention of OSHA is going and to convince us that the agency no longer deserves its red tape reputation. For me, the bottom line question is this. Will a re-engineered OSHA effectively and efficiently protect the safety of American workers? I'd like to, uh, to welcome um, our witness, but uh, before doing that, it's my distinct pleasure to, uh, to invite uh, Mr. Lantos, a, a gentleman who uh, I consider a model of, of the very best in Sherman in terms of his ability to uh, learn a lot at public hearings. And I welcome the gentleman back and uh, say it's an honor to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You and I shared uh, countless hours during the HUD hearings, and uh, I think you deserve a great deal of the credit for having cleaned up uh, at least some of the mess uh, during the Reagan administration in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And as you well know, uh, a very large number of individuals who testified before our committee um, are presently enjoying federal prison facilities, which is not an indication as to what will happen to our current witness. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I 
could not think of a more fair-minded Republican chairman than you are, and I enjoy uh, sitting here with you. But I cannot help but comment at the outset that the mindless assault on OSHA, uh, which has uh, in its relatively short existence of 25 years, has saved 140,000 American lives. And I want to repeat that. 140,000 American working men and women are alive today because of OSHA. An organization uh, which uh, so many other worthwhile organizations are under a frontal and brutal and mindless assault. And I will do my utmost uh, in this field as in other fields um, to prevent the wrecking crew from doing its work. Uh, it is as realistic to evaluate OSHA on the basis of some stupid bureaucratic red tape regulation of which I'm sure it is guilty than it is to evaluate the United States military in terms of the My Lai massacre. It is very easy to find anecdotal evidence of OSHA stupidity and incompetence, excessive bureaucracy and red tape. But I think it's important we don't lose sight of the overall objectives of OSHA. Since 1970, job fatality rates have been cut in half. Injury rates have fallen dramatically. And while we have had a great deal of progress, on an average working day, 154 working men and women lose their lives as a result of workplace injuries and illnesses. 16,000 are injured. There is a workplace death or injury every five seconds. And it must be on the conscience of those who would like to eviscerate and make impotent OSHA to respond to the hundreds of thousands and millions of American families whose breadwinner's health depends upon vigilant, hard-working OSHA work. Now OSHA, as you know, Mr. Chairman, has about 900 inspectors. This means that the average workplace can be inspected once every 87 years. And while some consider that excessive, I consider it woefully inadequate. The current budget of OSHA amounts to about $1 per citizen, and it compares with $350 per citizen that had to be spent to bail out the savings and loan industry. So when we talk about the excessive cost of OSHA, I hope we always bear in mind the 350 times higher cost because of incompetence and corruption and greed in the savings and loan industry. The uh, hope we have with respect to OSHA and every other agency that we can make it leaner, more cost effective, more up to date, more efficient, more effective. And I suspect we all join in that pursuit. But I think it's extremely critical as we examine this agency uh, that we recognize its enormous achievements, the appallingly unfair press it has received, and the determination of segments of uh, the employer community uh, who would like to destroy this watchdog of the health and safety of American working men and women. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his very important statement. And uh, um, at this time, 
Uh, I call our first witness, um, Mr. Joseph Deere, Assistant Secretary of Labor, Head of OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And uh, Mr. Deere, you uh, are highly praised by people on both employers and employees. It's a, a, a real pleasure to have you here. And uh, uh, I look forward to your statement. And as is the custom in our committee, uh, we swear in all our witnesses, I, I think you know. And if you would, uh, please stand. Do you so raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Note for the record that our witnesses responded in the affirmative. And if I could just uh, take care of some housekeeping, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statements in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, I also ask unanimous consent that the, uh, our witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and uh, without objection so ordered. Your statement is very important to us. Uh, we are discussing your agency and you should feel free uh, to uh, give your statement uh, free of any five minute uh, requirement. Um, I just like, just for the record, uh, just so I'm certain, I'm getting conflicting information. If you would just share before your testimony the total number of employees and the total number of inspectors you have. There are about 2,317 authorized FTE for OSHA in the fiscal 1995. Uh, about 1,000 of those are in positions designated for compliance. That includes supervision. It's important to also note that 21 states enforce health and safety uh, in private sector workplaces. Uh, they include about another 1,000 enforcement personnel. In, in, in rough terms, Mr. Chairman, there are approximately 2,100 compliance inspectors to cover 6 million workplaces. Not a particularly a large number for such a major task. Um, Mr. Deere, uh, welcome your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased to appear before the subcommittee today to discuss the mission of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and to describe the innovations that we're implementing to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness uh, of OSHA. Mr. Chairman, I applaud your longstanding concern for OSHA and for worker health and safety. Uh, the tragedy at Bridgeport at Lombions Plaza is with us every day at OSHA and reminds us of the importance to improve our operations so we can protect the health and safety of more workers. Mr. Lantos, I'm also familiar with your work and became familiar that well before I ever thought I might be in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the opportunity and the responsibility of ad administering uh, OSHA. Uh, the problem that OSHA is intended to address, the preventable injury, illness, and death in America's workplace, imposes a staggering human and economic toll. According to the National Safety Council, the cost of preventable accidents alone exceeds $112 billion to the economy. We don't have an accurate figure for losses associated with preventable illness. And the human side of that equation is incalculable, but huge and lasting on workers and their, and their families. OSHA's mission is to assure, so far as possible, every working man and woman in the nation safe and healthful employment. That mission is just as important today as it was almost 25 years ago when the Occupational Safety and Health Act was approved by the Congress. But because the mission is the same and as important does not mean we have to conduct our business in the same way. We can learn from 25 years of experience how to improve the effectiveness of OSHA's operation. What I'd like to do in summarizing my remarks is describe the reinvention initiatives of OSHA and how they're intended to accomplish improved results for workers, for employers, with our admittedly scarce resources. Why reinvent OSHA? Well, the, the first reason is both Mr. Chairman and, you, and Mr. Lantos have noted is that there is an enormous gap between the resources that OSHA has provided, $312 million in the last fiscal year and 2,300 people at the federal level, and the workforce and workplaces we're supposed to cover. Uh, the chart that illustrated uh, shows that gap. Uh, it's growing. OSHA hasn't basically changed in its staffing level for the past decade. Yet the workforce with rights under the Occupational Safety and Health Act continues to grow. 
So the first impetus behind the reinvention of OSHA is to close the gap with reinvention initiatives. The second impetus is that neither business nor labor expresses a great deal of satisfaction with OSHA's performance. As Mr. Lantos noted, OSHA has a lot to be proud of in terms of the reduction of fatalities which have occurred. And every day, millions of working men and women are protected by OSHA standards as they work. Uh, OSHA standards and cotton dust have helped eliminate, virtually eliminate, the presence of brown lung, by cystinosis in the textile industry. The grain handling standard has helped reduce fatalities by over 40 percent in the <coughs> grain handling industry. Even a relatively mundane hazard like trenching, where OSHA updated its standard in 1990, has seen a 30 plus percent decrease in trenching fatalities. These standards make a difference every day. Uh, OSHA's enforcement programs also make a difference. This chart illustrates that OSHA has concentrated the majority of its enforcement attention, that is its compliance inspections, in three industries. Manufacturing, construction, and oil and gas extraction. They're shown in, in red. Uh, and the injury and illness rates are illustrated there. Almost 85% of OSHA's compliance inspections between 1975 and 1993 were conducted in those three industries. And the orange bars illustrate that injury and illness rates in those industries declined. On the other hand, where just over 15% of OSHA's compliance activity was focused in wholesale, retail, agriculture, transportation, and health care, Injury and illness rates have all gone up during that same 1975 to 1993 time period. It tells us where we focus our enforcement energies, we can have an impact on worker health and safety. But we do have to target our limited resource. We have to decide where we're going to aim it. Let me go to the uh, next chart. Now, the question is, how can we target those limited enforcement resources so they can have the maximum impact, but also find other ways to leverage employers to get them to operate workplaces in a healthy and safe manner. And OSHA's reinvention is built around three strategies described in the report issued by President Clinton and Vice President Gore in May 1995 entitled Reinventing Worker Health and Safety. The three strategies are these. First, offer employers a choice between partnership or traditional enforcement. Second, use common sense in developing regulations and enforcing them. And third, focus OSHA on results, not red tape. Let me describe for each of these strategic initiatives what we're doing now. In the area of partnership or traditional enforcement, in the state of Maine, we identified employers who had a high number of workers' compensation claims, some 200 Maine employers. Uh, we wrote them and said, you're on our list. Uh, clearly, you have workplace health and safety problems. Uh, we will target you for a compliance inspection. However, if you develop a safety and health program and implement it, we'll move you to a secondary targeting list. Not surprisingly, most of the employers who received that letter opted for the development of a safety and health program. Uh, the impact of this program is illustrated in the chart uh, before you now. It, it shows on the left-hand side that OSHA, through traditional enforcement means, going out and physically inspecting these workplaces that were on our targeted list, would have found about 13,000 serious hazards. The participating companies in the Maine 200 program found 181,000 serious hazards and are working to abate them. Now, I'm not suggesting that every single one of those hazards would not have been found otherwise, but I think this chart illustrates the leverage that was possible because we offered these employers a choice and they opted for the partnership route. I've had a chance to visit with companies who participated in the Maine 200 program and they talk about the reduction in injury and illness, the improvement in labor management relations, and the improved relationship they have with OSHA as a result of this program. One employer told me that 
her responsibility included insurance purchases and worker health and safety. And the last thing she would consider doing to get help with a health and safety problem was to call OSHA. But because of the Maine 200 program, uh, she had the opportunity to discuss problems, uh, to get suggestions and advice about how to fix them. And now she said, I call the office so much they recognize my voice when I ask for one of the staff. So Maine 200 is one illustration of how we can leverage uh, the uh, willingness of employers to participate and develop uh, partnerships. Uh, the president has asked OSHA to nationalize this Maine 200 concept and to expand it to every state. Another example of partnership are the voluntary protection programs. These represent the highest level of partnership between OSHA employers and workers. Voluntary protection program sites have demonstrated sustained excellence in safety and health. As a group, they have injury and illness rates that are 60 percent below their industry peers. It's not an easy program to get in, and it's a program that requires work to stay in. Uh, participation in this program has about doubled during my time uh, at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, there are now 231 sites that participate in VPP programs, and some of our state plan partners are beginning to open their states up to VPP so that companies with national operations can have VPP sites all around the, the country. But these represent the very best models of excellence that can be used to show what is possible in, in safety and health. Now the other side of, of the partnership uh, is enforcement. And I, I want to underscore that as OSHA seeks to develop partnerships with employers to take advantage of the interest, be it economic or enlightened human resource management that many employers have for safety and health, it is utterly essential that there be a credible enforcement program. For some employers who choose traditional enforcement, the only way to get the message is through a credible enforcement program. Uh, we have, if you could switch the, the chart order, please. Uh, uh, in the past year, we have uh, increased uh, the number of what we call significant penalty cases substantially. Uh, we've defined those as penalty cases uh, with uh, citations exceeding $100,000. You can see that in uh, fiscal 92, uh, there were 57 such cases, 61 in 93, 68 in 1994, and 122 in 1995. This includes 17 egregious cases. Uh, egregious is our term for those situations that involve such violation of health and safety that we uh, multiply the violations times the number of workers exposed to the hazard. There were 17 such cases in fiscal 1995. So effective credi credible enforcement is part of this reinvention of OSHA. Where it's appropriate, we need to use that. Sure. May I ask the witness to tell us what was the most egregious case? I can think of, uh, of several. Uh, one that most recently uh, occurred was at a sheet metal firm in Philadelphia called Southwark. It had about 300 employees at the site. Uh, we took videotapes of the setting there. There were virtually no machine guards. About four finger amputations that occurred at the workers at that plant over a relatively short period. The impression I was left in viewing those uh, tapes was that I was looking at a workplace out of the 1890s, not the 1990s. And we settled with the company. They paid a very hard, large penalty, a million dollars, but the company decided that rather than to contest the citations, they would agree to abatement of the hazards. And we now have the attention of that company's ownership. They are working to solve the problems. We've resolved the, the, uh, the contest around the, the cases. The workers at that plant were primarily non-English speaking immigrants. Uh, they weren't aware uh, necessarily of their rights to a safe and helpful workplace. Uh, OSHA arrived there because of a programmed or random inspection. Uh, if we didn't have the capacity to do that kind of inspection, OSHA never would have showed up at that workplace in the conditions which I found so appalling would still exist today. Can you give us another one? Uh, it was 
another uh, small, uh, medium-sized uh, company in New Jersey uh, named Omega Plastics. Uh, this case is uh, still in contest. That is, it's not been completely resolved. Uh, in, in this situation, the employer purchased equipment from out of state, brought it to New Jersey and installed it, and left off all the machine guards. Uh, this is a company that made plastic parts. Again, we saw a number of amputations of fingers of workers. And notwithstanding those injuries, the machine guards were left off the equipment, even though uh, injuries were actually occurring at that workplace. Uh, that case uh, had a penalty of $1.4 million, and as I say, it is still uh, in contest. Thank you. I'd be happy to supply the committee with a list of all of the egregious cases for the past I think that would year. be very helpful. And if you just continue with your... Thank you. Now, the next initiative that is part of OSHA's reinvention is bringing common sense to the development of regulation uh, and to the enforcement of, of regulation. Uh, now, these may seem like blindingly obvious changes, but they are important and they're making a difference. In the development of regulations, the idea is to negotiate not dictate regulations, to bring those affected by the standard on the labor side, the business side, safety and health professionals, medical professionals, uh, into the standard setting process early. Uh, we are doing that in the construction industry with the negotiated rulemaking around the steel erection standard. This is a formal negotiation under the Negotiated Rulemaking Act, and I hope that that negotiated rulemaking committee will report a consensus proposal this fall which I said we will then publish for public hearing and comment. The largest killer of construction workers in the country are falls. And in the steel erection industry, that's a major hazard. Here we have the industry, labor, architects, engineers, working with OSHA standards writers to develop a standard. I know even if we fail to reach consensus, we'll have a better standard because it will be written with the practical experience of those who work in the industry and will have to live with it. We've done other less formal Approaches to rulemaking, we invited industry and labor in to help us look at ways of simplifying record keeping to reduce the paperwork burden associated with keeping statistics on injury and illness, but at the same time improving the accuracy of those statistics, which are fundamental to assessing the impact of OSHA and evaluating our, our programs. And I hope to be publishing that standard uh, for public comment this fall. We're working right now with industry and labor to develop a safety and health management program standard. They're meeting today in D.C. here to talk about uh, how we can move forward to develop a safety and health program standard. We've also looked at our existing uh, regulations. There's some 3,000 pages of OSHA regulations in the Code of Federal Regulation. At the President's request, we went over those page by page. We've identified 1,000 pages of duplicate standards that we can take out. We'll still be able to provide information to construction and maritime employers, but we won't need a lot of duplicate pages to do that. And we've looked at 600 pages of standards which were adopted without public hearing in 1971 under the original authority of the Occupational Safety and Health Without public hearing in 1971 under the original authority of the Occupational Safety and Health Act to ad adopt consensus standards uh, without public hearing. These standards are often the source of much of the complaint about confusing or difficult to understand regulations. We're going to rewrite those. Uh, there are, as I said, 600 pages of them. To give you one illustration of the potential here, uh, one of those standards uh, talks about uh, egress. It goes on for seven or eight pages to describe what adequate egress is from a facility. Uh, this is a, a term dear to the hearts of safety professionals. Uh, but you know, escape route might be a pretty good term for employers or workers to talk about what to do. And in rewriting this standard into plain English, we've discovered we can make it 40% shorter. Uh, it will take us quite a while to do all 600 pages, uh, but we will be publishing that proposed standard soon. And uh, our plan uh, this year is to do three more. Uh, and if we have the resources, we'll accelerate that effort. But it's common sense. Try to put the standard into plain language so that it's easy for non-experts to understand. The other side of the common sense initiative is how we enforce standards. Uh, the chart I'm showing now illustrates the number of times OSHA cited employers for violations of the poster requirement. Employers are obligated to post a sign that tells workers of their rights to 
a safe and healthful workplace. This is very important information. Uh, however, at, at different times, OSHA has, uh, in 1991, cited employers 4,319 times and penalized them for not having the poster up. Uh, beginning with this fiscal year, we changed our approach. Instead of not seeing the poster and finding the employer, we've said to employers, you need to have the poster up. It's important. Here is one. Please post it. And as you can see from the chart, the number of poster violations uh, fell to two in the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. Those were repeat uh, violations. If there are other safety and health problems in those workplaces, then they can be noted as serious hazards and cited appropriately. But the paperwork of poster violations has fallen from 24th most frequently cited OSHA violation to off the off the chart. When I describe OSHA's reinvention initiatives, I often hear people say they sound good, and then they question me about whether or not they will actually materialize in the field. Uh, working in Washington, D.C., we tend to become consumed with policy and legislation or regulation, but it's not real unless it happens at the workplace. If the compliance officer can't articulate the requirement, if the employer can't understand it, if the worker doesn't know what the correct procedure is, then we're not going to have a healthy and safe workplace. The average tenure for someone in my position is 18 months. I've just about made two years now. Uh, but one of the things that people in the organization say is this sounds like the flavor of the month. This is the management fad. And as they say about kidney stones, this too shall pass. Uh, uh, it's very important for OSHA's reinvention that we think about how it will affect our workers at the front line and their interaction with employers and workers. And we're devoting a considerable attention to the getting results, uh, not red tape part of our reinvention effort. Uh, to do this, we're taking a page from the best managed American businesses. We're asking our customers through surveys what do you expect? What kind of services do you need? How did we do in fulfilling that? We're asking our workers, what ideas do you have that can improve your effectiveness in the field? Uh, we're looking at taking quality improvement principles, total quality management, and applying them to our own operations to increase the effect, efficiency of our operation and to create resources to devote to other activities. We're trying to become data-driven to look at statistics of injury and illness, to analyze problems, to find root causes, and then to go out and work at those root causes rather than being completely reactive, responding only when there are complaints, accidents, or catastrophes. Uh, we're beginning to see results. We have designed a new program to conduct our day-to-day -day operations in the field. We've implemented it in seven of our 67 offices. We're doing five more this quarter and budget permitting. Uh, we will continue to roll out these newly designed offices at five per quarter until we're finished sometime in late 1997 or early fiscal 1998. Let me give you one illustration of what the practical impact of this reinvention in the, in the field is. One of the most important services OSHA provides is responding to worker complaints. Uh, it's their right to complain to us. Uh, it also comprises 25 percent of our workload in the field. And in some OSHA offices, all they have time to work on are complaints from workers. They do not have time and resources to do proactive inspections. So we ask workers who are involved in that process to sit down, chart out the work, identify the value-added steps, identify the non-value-added steps, and design a better way of handling worker complaints. And this chart illustrates what our frontline workers were able to do. The orange bars show the average time to respond to an informal worker complaint. That's the time Can we received. I just received interrupt it? you a second, just so I'm understanding. You're, you're using worker in two contexts, your own OSHA workers yes. and uh, who are responding to uh, workers' complaints out in the field. Yes, thank you okay. for the clarification. I, I'll try to make that distinction. The worker complaints I refer to are, are workers in private sector uh, employment, typically. They'll call us. They'll say, I want to report a problem. Uh, in the past, OSHA would then say, well, could you put it in writing? Uh, if they didn't, we would put it in writing. We'd mail a letter to the employer. The employer would get the letter. If it was a large employer, it would, might 
go around in the employer's organization a while before it got to the desk of somebody who could do something. And the consequence here is for our Persippany, New Jersey office, for example, it took 50 days from the time we got a complaint to when we had documentation that the hazard was corrected. Now, if we get a worker complaint and the worker is agreeable, we'll call the employer the same day we get the complaint. We'll say, well, we've had a report of a complaint. What do you say? We want to secure a verbal commitment from the employer that they will check into the complaint and correct it if they do. We then fax our description of the complaint to them. We ask them to take corrective action and to document. They'll call us back, send in a photograph. The Parsippany office can now respond to worker complaints in an average of nine days. And as the chart illustrates in Atlanta, Savannah, Columbus, Kansas City, St. Louis, and Wichita, have all seen at least 50% improvements in the response time, and some of those offices have seen 75 and 80% improvements in response time. This to me is some of the best of, of reinvention. We've gotten this idea from our workers. Our customers like it. Workers are reported amazed to see action being taken so promptly after their complaint was voiced, and employers have told us that they appreciate the opportunity to hear from us, to explain their side of the story, and to take corrective action without uh, a physical inspection. Now, we will inspect if a worker insists on that. That's a legal duty we have, and we will do that. But many times, what workers want is the hazard corrected. And this is a way of doing it much more quickly. And because there's much less paper follow-up, it frees up resources in our office so that we can devote our time and attention to problem-solving approaches, root cause uh, analysis. Yeah. Let me, when I gave you your invitation <coughs> to not feel uh, inhibited by any limit, uh, there were only two members here, and now uh, I might say that we've been joined by Mr. Green from Texas, uh, Mr. Souter from Indiana, Mr. Martini from New Jersey, Ms. Morella from Maryland, and Mr. Scarborough from Florida. And so you will probably have the opportunity to just talk a lot more by responding to our questions. So I'm going to kind of encourage you to come to a conclusion pretty soon. Uh, so do you, do you have much more to... Uh, just, a, just one basic uh, observation. Sure. Uh, I, I came to Washington believing that there's an enormous potential for common ground between employers and workers around the issue of workplace safety and health, that healthy and safe workplaces are self-evidently good for workers. It respects their fundamental human dignity in a profound way, but it's also good for employers because healthy and safe employers are profitable and competitive employers. And that's what the reinvention of OSHA is about. Again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to join with the committee today. I, I appreciate you being here, uh, um, Mr. Secretary. And what I'm going to ask is this is the mic that, that basically uh, amplifies in the room. And you can even lift that other one up a little bit and, and uh, then good. that's great. Um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, yield and uh, not yield, but to give the floor to Mr. Souter to start the questions. But let me ask you the, the substantive changes you've talked about um, are uh, we can see the process results in terms of the amount of time it's taking your inspectors and you can reorient their time. Is it too early to? Uh, to, uh, to conclude whether there are uh, noticeable differences in the workplace in terms of reduced injuries and, and uh, deaths? Uh, is it too early to determine that at this point? Uh, for Maine, uh, we know that re re reported incidence of injury and illness in the two years that the program has run has declined by 60. It's, it's 60 percent of the employers that are lower injury and illness rates. Now, that program began in early 1993. You didn't say uh, 6 percent. Six, 60 yeah. percent of the employers. Well, we'll probably get into that. That's uh, uh, quite a on statistic. The, the redesigned offices, uh, there's good anecdotal information. Uh, the first offices implemented the new procedures uh, le uh, less than a year ago. So there hasn't been enough time to demonstrate empirically that uh, the impact we seek is occurring. But all of these uh, new programs were designed to measure impact as part of the program. Thank you. Mr. Souter? Uh, first, I wanted to compliment you on reducing the number of technical violations and things like the uh, poster violations and so on. And, uh, I have heard repeatedly what a nice guy you are and how friendly you are. It doesn't change who you represent in my eyes, but I want to compliment you uh, 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 personally and say that we all respect that you're trying to do the best you can regardless of how we uh, may agree or not agree. You raised uh, concerns about uh, Congressman Ballinger's bill. I wanted to know, do you still support uh, Senator Kennedy's bill in the Senate? Is that what OSHA would still support at this point? or? 
Well, that bill is not before the Congress. Uh, we did support it when it was introduced uh, in the 103rd Congress. Uh, I think there were very important elements in that uh, bill, uh, providing through a, worker, a, a real voice for worker participation in statute, uh, addressing some problems with inadequate standards that could be remedied, uh, addressing the lack of coverage for state and local employees in 29 federal enforcement states, uh, and a variety of issues like that. What I had uh, hoped would have happened in the 103rd Congress and what I will hope happens in the 104th Congress is that we can engage a debate on a principled basis looking at 25 years of experience with occupational safety and health under the Act and decide whether the problems can be solved administratively, which I believe they largely can be, or whether statutory adjustments are necessary. But extreme proposals on, uh, on either side I don't believe will actually improve situations uh, at the workplace. You made a <clears throat> statement in your um, in the record, a uh, number of statements, criticizing the Ballinger Bill, and there's a, uh, what I'd like to insert into the record is a uh, Labor Policy Association report that uh, suggests some of the similarities between the administration and Congressman Ballinger's bill as opposed to an expansion, which, which Senator Kennedy does. And if you can go through that, and if you have any comments for the record uh, later on, rather than uh, try to bring this on and, and go through that at this at this point. I also um, had a couple of, of technical uh, questions on numbers. I saw you had a reference to a decline in grain elevators uh, based on uh, uh, the number of injuries based 58 percent, I think the number was. Um, have you frozen those for, uh, is that 58 percent for the same number of grain elevators? Uh, have you frozen any other variables? Uh, I know, for example, the grain elevator in my hometown no longer has injuries. They closed down. Uh, it's an industry that has had huge uh, numbers uh, going out of that industry. In fact, on your chart, the ones with declining uh, numbers of injuries are predominantly declining industries, and the ones where you have increasing number of injuries are growing industries. Uh, are those numbers uh, in indicative of, of what OSHA is doing? Or are they in, uh, numbers that merely are reflecting changes in the economy and somewhat give a misleading uh, approach to what OSHA's effectiveness is? Well, my testimony referred to evaluations of four standards, lead, uh, cotton dust, uh, trenches, and grain elevators. Those represent uh, studies that were done, and we'd be happy to turn those over to the committee. So those were frozen in time. Uh, with respect to the point about manufacturing employment, as a relative sense, there may have been a decline. There's still uh, millions of workers that are employed in manufacturing establishments, millions in construction. Um, those hazards are very real, and the presence of ocean enforcement has helped reduce injury and illness. The lesson I think we have to apply as we watch the growth of the service sector is uh, how do we address those issues? Uh, it may be through enforcement. It may be through other means. Uh, we're lacking some critical standards in the uh, service sector area to help guide employers what they need to do to prevent musculoskeletal disorders, among uh, other injuries. I think it's really important in both places to be very careful what numbers we use because, uh, and that's really what I was getting. I, I think, uh, did you say at lunch or was it one of the other speakers over at the chamber a, a while ago that OSHA gets around about once every 88 years if, they, if you took the number of visits times the number of employers? There are a number of figures that are bandied about. You're right at the chamber meeting today, the figure once in 88 uh, years is used. Uh, we've calculated it at once in 62 years on a nationwide basis. It really is kind of academic 60, 80 years. Uh, even if you isolate low hazard workplaces out, uh, you're still talking of frequency of once every 20 years. It's why the reliance solely on enforcement through physical inspection is likely to yield little and more in terms of result because the frequency of coverage. I'm, I'm convinced that the public's perception is we're a much larger agency than that or we might have a larger non-compliance problem. I'll just say on the surface that if it's, whether it's 20 years, 62 years or 88 years, it would suggest that there are other forces at the econ in the economy as well that are pushing for safety and it isn't just OSHA regulations because you're not likely to be living in fear of a visit every 62 years. Uh, there are other forces too that are pushing health and safety in addition to OSHA. There's no denying that it helped. Uh, the question is, is how much of the credit goes where? And that's important when we look at the different pieces of legislation. Um, I'm going to try to enforce the five minute rule given the number of members and Mr. Lantos. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Secretary, uh, I am intrigued by this emphasis on partnerships, because when we held hearings in earlier Congresses here, we had hearings exploring terrible working conditions, utterly irresponsible employers providing a nightmare in terms of lack of safety, lack of decent working conditions. Uh, we had uh, a, an avalanche of witnesses testifying to the horrors they had to go through. And I am just wondering what your approach is to bad employers. Everybody rationally would like to see well-intentioned employers and well-intentioned unions working together and OSHA helping in a constructive fashion. But of course, that's not the way the world is built in any arena. And there are people who, for economic or other reasons, want to cut corners on safety and health. <coughs> And uh, with, uh, with the enormous cutback, 33% uh, cutback in enforcement, uh, the agency's enforcement efforts will be decimated. The best estimates I saw is that fifth, there would be a 50% reduction in inspections. And you in your testimony state, 50,000 more injuries a year to American working men and women. Now, the people who are voting for these abominations have a responsibility to explain to the American people why they favor 50,000 more injuries to working men and women in the United States. And my question to you is, first with respect to this issue of good employers, bad employers, how do you plan to deal with this? Partnership surely is not the answer in every instance, as your egregious stories earlier indicated. Second question I want to uh, raise, uh, relates to the, uh, to the ergonomic standards. As Ms. Shays will remember, we had a number of hearings on, on the question of ergonomics. Uh, we, we, we were appalled by the range of industries where men and women become permanently crippled, from uh, newspapers to uh, meatpacking, uh, young men and women, middle-aged men and women, being permanently unemployable because the employers were unwilling to use appropriate ergonomic standards. Now, riders have been attached to the 95 rescission bill and the 96 appropriation measure, which will prohibit the agency from developing standards or guidelines on this issue, which I think is an abomination, nothing short of an abomination. It destroys the physical health and the mental health of vast numbers of American working men and women and deprives their families of somebody who can earn a living for them. How does OSHA plan to deal with this? I mean, you have asked two uh, large questions. Uh, the strategy that says we want to build partnership involves a choice, and the other side of that choice is a traditional enforcement relationship. As I indicated in my testimony, we've stepped up enforcement. We doubled the number of egregious cases in the past year, and none of those were record-keeping cases, which in the early years of egregious was one of the emphasis. Well, don't minimize the record-keeping uh, cases. Mr. Shays and I sat through testimony here where we had double sets of books by employers. So record keeping is not a minor little technical issue. Record keeping can be a big issue. If the employer keeps a double set of books, the real injuries appear in a book that are not shown anybody, and the phony set of figures are presented to OSHA, we are dealing with an outrage that OSHA needs to deal with. Of, of course you're right, but we've concentrated on violations of standards and egregious that have actually resulted in injury or death. Uh, to workers. I said we doubled the number of those cases in the past year and we vastly increased the number of high penalty cases. Trying to do that and then trying to get notice of those actions so that it's transmitted throughout the industries, uh, throughout the communities where these occur is one of the most effective deterrents OSHA has. That is, uh, again, as I indicated earlier, we're very much emphasizing that choice. Some employers have already chosen and they've chosen the enforcement route. Their behavior is such that the offer of a partnership to fix things is not appropriate. 
the other employers who have given the opportunity to work cooperatively with us will do a lot more than we could if we were depending on getting to that workplace and inspecting. And that's where the leverage comes. The difficult resource allocation choice for us is we could spend all our time on enforcement. It could consume all of our resource. We could do none of the partnership initiatives. Well, will that further us better than trying to balance the approaches? And I think we're trying to find that balance. I don't know if today we've, we've done it. We haven't seen the full potential of the partnerships. But I know we'll have a lot less willing partners if we don't have effective enforcement. Uh, with respect to ergonomics, uh, your hearings were what I referred to when I talked about my knowledge of your work before I ever came to Washington. Uh, my predecessors began work to develop a standard to protect workers from work-related musculoskeletal disorders. It's a huge problem, and it's a very expensive problem. Something like $20 billion, a third of the nation's workers' compensation expense, is associated with overexertion and repetitive motion injuries. It afflicts workers uh, in uh, a way that can disable them for life, for a lifetime. Uh, I carried forward that work from prior administrations, assembled a team, and made the development of a proposed regulations one of our top priorities. And where are we today? I'm prohibited by the Congress from suggesting to the public that we have a proposed remedy to this solution. And in addition to the restrictions from the Fiscal 95 Rescission Bill, which says we can't promulgate a proposed or final rule or issue a guideline, no guideline, the 96 appropriations language from the House says we can't even collect data on the problem. And I'm absolutely confounded by that since this is the same body that wants us to improve the science and the economics that we use to develop our standards. Uh, we need to be able to put a proposal before employers and workers and see, engage what that reaction is. Uh, I can be very flexible about how to approach that, but we need to address this problem. It's not going away and pretending it's not there it doesn't help anybody. Thank you. Mr. Martini? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for holding this, uh, this important hearing. And I do have some opening remarks, which I would ask unanimous consent to submit in the record. For the, uh, for, if I could interrupt the gentleman, uh, for all members, uh, there is unanimous consent. No, any, any information or statement, any information will be inserted in the record. Thank you very much. But I would like to try to summarize uh, uh, and then formulate a, a question or two to the Secretary, if I may. And um, I guess I would first like to begin by saying, as is often the case with some of the things that uh, we've learned uh, in the short uh, tenure of being a freshman congressman, often uh, uh, the case is uh, programs begin with good intentions and goals and meet those intentions and goals and certainly OSHA in many respects has achieved some of the goals and, and uh, intentions that were set out by when it was in fact enacted into law. But also I think we find, as is often the case, that the pendulum tends to swing beyond many of the intentions and goals and goes to the extreme situations. And we have been the, uh, I guess we have been the recipient of listening to and hearing of complaints in the workplace. Uh, and also as a former local elected official, uh, even at the municipal and county levels, of some of the excesses that exist in the current system, um, which seem to uh, raise all of our concerns as, uh, as to whether we are today still reaching those goals. But you mentioned in your comments whether or not these could be addressed, some of the excesses can be addressed either administratively through reforms or that are being initiated currently, or whether they require the actions of Congress. And I think you also mentioned the term effective enforcement. And, and how we get to that is, is really the question that's most on my mind, especially when uh, in preparation for this hearing, we had the benefit of looking at a, a memorandum, an internal memorandum of, the, uh, of OSHA, which I think sets forth better than anything I can say. And it's a memorandum about the concerns issued to compliance officers who are issuing HCS citations uh, with respect to products like uh, dish, dishwater uh, bricks, uh, lubricating oils, dishwashing liquid, et cetera. And you're probably familiar with this March 21st, 1995 memo. And if you're not, I'd like to make it a part of the record uh, for purposes of this hearing. But I guess this sums it up better than any questions I could ask. We're here today, and this is only some months ago, and we're talking about how do we avoid these excesses, and these are the types of excesses that I think 
uh, are of great concern to the employers and municipalities and and um, in county counties and I think this is clearly what we would refer to as a paperwork type of citation which is probably more cumbersome in your agency than than actual substantive citations in many respects and so I guess first my question is in the face of a very recent uh, uh, memorandum uh, what assurance do we have that this can be addressed purely through administrative oversight um, because it would seem to me that this is something that should have never even gotten to this point versus defining better what it is we're looking and overseeing. That's number one. And then if we have time, I have another question, if I may. Well, hazard communication is enormously important because there are only chemical standards, exposure limits for about 400 plus chemicals, yet there are 20 or 30,000 toxic substances in use in workplaces. And hazard communication was developed as a way of providing information to workers and their employers about the nature of the substances they were working with, what signs of adverse health effects are and what first aid remedies. So yes, you have to put it in paper, so it is, it's, it's paperwork, but this can be enormously important life-saving information. We're reviewing and revising the enforcement of that standard, as you noted from the memorandum that we, we sent out. We've also asked our National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health to re review the hazard communication standard uh, altogether, and there's a work group that meets this week in fact, to do that, our advisory committee is a statutory labor management uh, public advisory committee. They've been given staff. I think there are two problems with the hazard communication. Uh, one is we haven't looked at opportunities to use information technology to ease compliance since the standard was developed. And there may well be ways of uh, vastly reducing the, re the burden on uh, small employers with technology solutions. And secondly, if you look at a material safety data sheet, which is what is required, it's often very difficult to understand. So in terms of getting useful information to the worker, there's an uh, opportunity for uh, improvement. To demonstrate what we're doing, in 1994, we cited construction employers for 15,000 violations of the hazard communication standard. In 1995, we cited them 7,000 uh, times. That's a result of our focused inspection and construction program and that, and that emphasis. So uh, I am willing and I support the elimination of penalties which don't represent serious threats to uh, uh, worker health and safety, but I do not agree that failing to provide information about toxic chemicals to workers is a non-serious problem. Mr. Chairman, may I just follow up? 10 seconds, if I may. The problem I have is you're not addressing the, I guess, lack of supervision of even the own compliance officers. When they start to go out and issue citations for dishwashing liquid and welding rods and lubricating oils and bricks and, and things like that, uh, we all know there's a need for a certain amount of hazardous information to, in the workplace. But th this is the type of example of firsthand I saw all too often at the very local and municipal levels. And uh, I don't know how we remedy that, and I don't think you can do it administratively. I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, this is a current memorandum let, which let me, uh, strikes I home. I could say it's a, that was a long 15 seconds. My <laughs> challenge is that um, uh, what I'd like to do is allow members, if they uh, would like to, to ask you a second round of questions and would keep it under five minutes. But um, I'd like to give you a chance to respond if you'd like, but I want to be now generous to my colleague on my right side to extend over five minutes. That's the challenge. If, if, if I could it, yes. briefly uh, yeah. respond, because you get to a, a larger question here. How do you measure performance? Uh, organizations perform according to the incentives that exist within them. Uh, OSHA's performance was measured uh, primarily by looking at the number of inspections that were done. And then underneath that number, uh, how many violations were found per inspection and how many penalty dollars we collected. That's what Congress budgeted. What was the primary workload driver in our appropriation? Number of inspections. And this existed over the Carter administration, Reagan, Bush, into the Clinton administration. The primary measurement of OSHA activity, since I don't think it's a result, was number of inspections. Now, I think we're here to reduce injury, illness, and death in the workplace. Now, that's the output that we should be measured against. So what I've done in, in OSHA is to take out what our own people call the numbers game, trying to get inspections, trying to get violations for inspection. Why were some employers cited for serious violations for relatively minor and to the public seemingly nonsensical failures to provide uh, information about common household products? Because it wasn't a good inspection if you didn't get 4.2 violations. I'm that can be fixed administratively, and evaluations of performance of workers, supervisors, and me 
uh, can be conducted accordingly. I'm learning Thank as you. a new chairman that the way you get around the five-minute rule is you basically ask all your questions in the first five minutes, and then you allow the gentleman to take the next five minutes to respond. I didn't want to give you an opportunity. And you're only a freshman, you. and you've learned that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Green. Uh, I'd like to thank the secretary for being here today. And, and I guess my experience in the private sector was during the 80s before the reform, and I helped work and manage a, a printing company and I walked through our printing shop with OSHA inspectors and I I received the impression and, and I wasn't told by it but they were just looking for violations there were uh, I think the the goal of what you're doing the administration's doing is recognizing that uh, you can't set a quota and I know there was never an official quota but I sure got that impression on two occasions during the 80s, and that wasn't during this administration. That was during two previous administrations in the, in the private sector. And I guess my concern was I was a legislator at that time. Uh, in Texas, we served part-time. And, uh, and I, this inspector knew very little about the printing industry. In fact, he was not concerned about what we were concerned about, people getting their hand caught into the press and things like that they were looking for what I called minor violations just to be able to write me up or write the business up. I was not the owner. I was a manager of it. But I'm glad you're changing that because, again, that was, that was my experience during the 80s, and, and, uh, but I left that in 1990. Uh, let me, some of your testimony that you did, did not get to, uh, to give because of the time schedule. And... Uh, that I was interested where you talked about the 1996 appropriations bill for both the DOL, HHS, and education that passed uh, our house in July that would slash enforcement programs by 33 percent? Yes. Okay. And it would result in a 50 percent reduction in the inspections? That's correct. Now, I know my colleague mentioned the 50,000 more injuries a year, <clears throat> and we went over the numbers games that we talked about that, you know, uh, whether it's every 60 years or 80 years or every 20 years, but you do have to have the ability to inspect uh, just as a basis, but, but that is not going to cause a safe workplace in itself. It has to be other programs, and I think you're trying to institute that. Let me, uh, and I'm also serving on another committee. In fact, my colleague and I, Mr. Chairman, that's why we, were, we uh, weren't here. We were in a uh, hearing, and, and we were the only couple of members there for that hearing on, on the economic and educational opportunity. In the remainder of your statement, you talk about if H.R. 1834 that we will consider in that committee had been in effect in 1989, OSHA could have issued only a penalty of $10,800 for the explosion and fire that killed 23 workers at a Phillips 66 plant in Pasadena, Texas. I represent that plant facility, and I was there before, and I was there after that, uh, that plant exploded. Again, I was not in Congress at that time, uh, but I represent that facility now. I represent it across the ship channel at that time in the State Senate. If H.R. 1834 passed, it would actually, with that tragedy that happened, because, again, I'm honored to represent the Houston ship channel, but we also have a volatile product in, in, uh, that we produce, and we have had explosions in the past. In fact, I've, a good friend of mine was a plant manager at a, at a facility not close to the Phillips plant that caused death and injury, and that plant manager literally lost his friends in that. And, and so it wasn't necessarily his fault. But, you know, somebody has to be overseeing, and that is a good company, but and Phillips is too in, in uh, a great many cases. Good companies do make mistakes. And... Uh, in your testimony you're giving us today, if that bill passes as Congress, um, with the explosion and loss of life at Phillips, there would only have been a $10,000 loss? That's or correct. Penalty. Because uh, the H.R. 1834 uh, would prohibit OSHA from issuing penalties for violations under the General Duty Clause. The General Duty Clause is a basic requirement that employer provide a workplace and a place of an, uh, an employment free of recognized hazard. At the time of the catastrophe at, at Phillips, there was no standard which pertained specifically to the operation of highly hazardous uh, chemical facilities. We do now have such a standard, the process safety management standard. The only way we could uh, conduct uh, enforcement and sanction for 
Uh, that tragedy, which killed 23 workers, was under the general duty clause. And under H.R. 1834, no more. In fact, under that bill, uh, unless there's a serious injury or illness, uh, there'd be no effective enforcement at all the first time OSHA visited. And if we're there once every 60 years and the next visits in the next century, uh, the whole notion of prevention is turned on its head with that bill. Well, and I like the statistics you showed us with the main example, because again, as a, as a business person, I would like to, if there is some way to safeguard the workers that, that I happen to be working with, I want to do it. Um, and to, to have both the carrot and the stick, but you can't just go with the carrot. You have to have that stick every once in a while, and by slashing the uh, appropriations a third and taking away that ability. Although, again, as you have testified today, it is not the same as it was five years ago or even four years ago uh, or maybe even three years ago with occupational safety. And I want to encourage you to continue that because the reason you see bills like 1834 and the effort from a, a lot of members of Congress is a frustration with that, uh, with that uh, program that we've perceived and some of us actually experienced. And I would like to, my last question, before, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me just say for the record, you, you are over your five minutes, but I, and I'd, okay. I'd like to be fair to both okay. sides here and feel free to ask that. that Is it if you could tell us some in the business community who, uh, who it may not be in favor of turning OSHA into a consultative agency? And, and again, I like the idea of consulting, but I also like to, uh, as, a, as a policymaker now, to make sure we still have that, that stick to go out and enforce those unsafe job sites that, that we know are out there? I mean, consultation is, uh, is important. You find an employer who knows they uh, have a problem, they want to help, uh, they need help working on it. We uh, have a grant program that operates in 44 states and provide assistance in the remaining states for a consultation program that provides services free of charge to small businesses and high hazard industries that are operated through uh, programs in state commerce and labor departments. Uh, Texas, as a result of its workers' compensation reform, vastly stepped up the uh, consultation assistance available to employers and made it a requirement for insurers doing business in the state to provide that kind of uh, assistance. And that can be useful. But it's just a matter of common sense. If there's no enforcement, who's going to ask for a consultation? Some employers will. But a lot will just move that item down further on their priority list. They won't get to it. Something terrible will happen, and we'll all feel that we've, we've let down. Mr. Green, I was, is Deer Park in your uh, district? I have the industrial part of Deer Park. I have well, Shell I, Refinery. Uh, I visited, the Shell. I have the, I visited the Shell Refinery. Uh, I met with the Labor Management Committee there. I mean, they're keenly aware of the extremely uh, low probability, but the high catastrophe potential of their operation. And they're an example of what happens when a labor union and a company decide they're going to work together. When management says, we're going to listen to the voice of workers, those folks need encouragement. And they need recognition for their effort. There are other employers that need to know that the government's keeping a sharp eye on them. Ms. Morello? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Deer, for your testimony. And I know it's a very lengthy one that you've given all of us to, uh, to peruse and to study. I'd like to just address a, a question with regard to federal employees. Um, I'm certainly concerned about the health and safety hazards that our federal employees face on a daily basis. And according to a report from your agency, in 1991 there were more than 170,000 work-related injuries and illnesses in the federal government at a cost of more than $1.5 billion. I um, would like to ask you what can be done to make uh, our federal environment uh, uh, safer for these workers and add to that the fact that, for instance, in 1992, the American Federation of Government Employees, AFG, conducted a study relating to repetitive motion injuries at the Social Security Administration. And among the results, like 78.4 percent of the employees surveyed uh, experienced pain in their shoulders, arms, elbow, and, and necks. 53.8 percent have had pain, aching, stiffness, burning, numbness, 56.5 percent wake up during the night. And, you know, a lot of this is 
part of that carpal tunnel syndrome. And of course, it, uh, most of the workers who experienced the injuries were women. I just wondered if you're aware of that survey and if you'd like to offer any comments with regard to the federal environment for our workers. I'm not aware of that survey specifically, but I must say I'm, I'm not surprised since the work activities of the Employees and Social Security Administration <coughs> involving intensive keying all day long would produce the same sorts of injury we see for their counterparts in the, in the private sector. Uh, OSHA undertook one major enforcement action in the federal sector in the past year. That was an investigation of the uh, fire at the South Canyon. Uh, uh, Glenwood Springs fire in Colorado that took the lives of 14 firefighters. This was a, a, a very detailed, lengthy, and in, intensive in, uh, investigation into the causes uh, of that. It represented our most significant enforcement action in the past year. I'm happy to report that both the Department of Agriculture and particularly the Interior Department have taken our report to heart and are working hard to implement changes and to see that a tragedy like that uh, doesn't occur. Uh, in some, it, my, my second observation, which probably should be the first is, I think public employers and federal employers should have exactly the same obligation as private employers. After all, we're just talking about workers and you know, the color of the check shouldn't make a difference in terms of the degree of protection those workers uh, are afforded. Uh, in many instances when OSHA interacts with federal agencies, the agencies are responsive and will address the concerns, but there have been cases where those agencies have not. And in those instances, OSHA has no enforcement ability at all. We can be ignored. Hmm. Uh, the administration supported a reform of, of uh, occupational safety and health law for the federal sector to treat federal employers the same as private sector uh, uh, employers, and I think that would be an, an appropriate step. Uh, hmm. Otherwise, we're in the same predicament with the federal sector as we are with the private sector. We have an enormous responsibility. There are many problems and we have very limited resources uh, to deal with them. Have you suggested uh, any performance standards for um, managers at federal agencies? We have at the Department of Labor. Uh, uh, it's outside my purview and in my uh, knowledge, but uh, the way in which workers' compensation uh, benefits are charged to the agency uh, is uh, not as responsive as uh, private sector workers' right, compensation right. experience rating is. And uh, if that was fed into the budgets of the agencies so that they had uh, some more of the bottom line uh, encouragement to uh, manage prevention and disability management, I think it could be beneficial. It's going to be hard to do it financially, but I think certainly in terms of uh, um, making sure that we do have some kind of um, uh, performance uh, satisfaction and guarantees on the federal sector is appropriate because I agree with you I think the federal sector should not be ignored as we're looking for uh, standards and uh, workplace safety thank you mr. chairman thank you gentlelady and uh, mr. S uh, gentlewoman uh, mr. Scarborough well, I'm sorry I'm, I'm Mr. Char I apologize. thank you Ta Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Mr. Deere, uh, later on this committee is going to hear, mm -hmm. at least it's evident by the written testimony from someone who represents American workers, uh, the steel workers, who says that, um, that what you do is important, in fact, that it saves lives. Uh, he talks about, uh, it's discussed in the, in the written doc, uh, document uh, that's been supplied to the committee that some 35 individual members uh, died last year on the job and 26 so far uh, this year in various um, workplaces. These cuts that are uh, in the FY96 budget and the legislative constraints uh, around enforcement issues, you know, I mean, because we all deal in a lot of political rhetoric, I mean, is it, if you put what you've said about that in your testimony and what is uh, going to be told to the committee a little bit later on, is, is, it seems pretty clear that what we're talking about is the fact that we're going to be jeopardizing the lives of American workers uh, if this Congress continues to go in the direction that it's going relative to OSHA. Do you think, is that a true statement? Is that an overstatement? Uh, what's your professional judgment? Uh, I agree with that. I, I think the consequence of gutting OSHA's enforcement capacity will be more injury and illness to American workers. And in the end, we won't be saving anybody anything. Not the workers who will suffer the consequences of those injury and illnesses, 
for a lifetime, and not their employers who will pay uh, directly and, and indirectly for that, all in the name of saving $48 million, uh, which is the amount of the uh, overall house cut. Uh, now, furthermore, now that cut will will inhibit our ability to move in the new direction we're trying to get to, which will not only keep us at the present level of prevention, but will augment that, that will increase it. How can I do a DPP site evaluation to recognize excellence and to set up a model in a community of how to do it in the best sense possible if all I've got resources to do is to go investigate accidents, fatalities, and catastrophes? Well, uh, let, let me go a, a little bit further. The um, most of your work, a lot of your work, is in voluntary compliance and technical assistance uh, to companies. But in all good, uh, there's some bad. I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously most employers want to provide a safe workplace. Um, I'm very concerned about the the cuts in enforcement. I'm having difficulty with the numbers. You say on one hand you got a 33 percent cut and uh, a 50 percent drop in inspections. And I, if you could have us understand more clearly why those numbers are different um, rather than a 33 percent cut in inspections? It, a 33 percent cut will force us to reduce our staff. When we reduce staff, it costs money. Basically, for every two employees I riff, I have to riff a third employee to pay the cost of the other riff. Uh, because of the procedures that are established uh, in conditions when employees are reduced, uh, we have no control over uh, who is left. It's a, it's a contractual and a legal obligation that we have to follow. That means that as a, a function is closed down, those people uh, lose their jobs and they have a right, depending on their seniority, uh, to other jobs in the organization. The displacement then can occur in different geographic locations and we're obligated to pay the cost of the move, as we should be. But the short-term consequence of this is that the immediate cut is much deeper than uh, an effect on okay. operations. So, so you have a budget cut on one side that, that hurts in inspections. Is there, are there also other provisions that cause you not to do inspections until there's some significant um, event that takes place before you can go out and do an inspection? Well, there's a priority. Okay. Uh, a complaint of imminent danger requires an immediate response, okay. uh, a report of a fatality or catastrophe, like the Pennzoil explosion in Pennsylvania yesterday. I mean, we have five or six people on site right now. Well, let was drop everything and, right. and go there and, uh, uh, and begin to work to find out what uh, happened. So the priorities drive the, the work. When you run out of workers to do the work, then everything beneath that becomes something that's not done. And one of the things that won't get done are proactive, random, uh, inspections. Uh, well, let me, let me thank you for your testimony. And in, in conclusion, I, I think it is of interest that we have American workers who are working every day, who are paying taxes, to help support an agency that hopefully, in some important ways, helps to protect their life and their health. And that we think, as a Congress, that somehow that's not a good enough thing to do with their dollars. And I think it's unfortunate. And I hope that we would find ways to restore these funds. Thank you. I thank the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania and Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for uh, holding the hearing. And I'd just like to follow up. I, I certainly think it's, it's a noble goal for government to try to protect life and health, but I think it's also important for us to do a balancing act where not only do we protect workers' lives and health, but also protect uh, their jobs and make sure that regulations aren't so overly burdensome uh, that uh, their jobs and, and the business isn't put in jeopardy. Let me say this. Um, I, I had a visit with Monsanto uh, in my district in uh, northwest Florida. And Monsanto, I, I believe, is part of the VPP program. I couldn't get them to say anything bad about OSHA. I mean, you all, you know, you, you, you're doing a good job in, in that area. Uh, they were extremely pleased with the program. It was, it was like nothing I've ever heard uh, from, from business. And, and I think you should be commended for that. My concern has come, and I think uh, many concerns echo the concerns that Mr. Green stated earlier, comes more from small businesses. And I'm sure you, you recognize the problems there. Uh, the White House uh, conference on small businesses singled OSHA out just in June of 1995 as one of their major obstacles. Uh, also, we had a, a meeting, I believe it was the Government Reform and Oversight uh, Committee had a meeting with, with Vice President Gore a few months back, 
and the Republicans had their say first, the five or so that were there, and all of them were criticizing OSHA. And then the vice president turned to the Democrats and basically was saying, come on, you know, I'm waiting for the cavalry to come in, and the Democrats all criticized OSHA. And obviously, uh, Congressman uh, Lantos wasn't there. But uh, anyway, you do, it, you, you do recognize that there is uh, a perceived adversarial problem between OSHA and small businesses, uh, do you not? Oh, sure. I was at the small business conference and, and, and met so with them. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, I don't think that the right to a, a safe and healthy place to work uh, should be dependent on the size of your employer, that the right extends to all workers regardless of where they work. Uh, at the same time, we have to recognize that depending on the size of the firm, the internal resources available to the firm to deal with health and safety issues may be quite limited. For a new firm with a few employees where the entrepreneur is struggling every day, it's quite a challenge to, to stay in business. The balance we have to find is how to rec reconcile that right of a worker to have a safe and healthful workplace and not to have a variable application of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, around the country with the different ability of firms uh, to, to manage safety and health or other regulatory obligations. A number of specific steps we're taking now. We're revising our penalty policy. Uh, we're saying that employers who demonstrate a commitment to health and safety through a plan, doesn't even have to be a written plan, but through a, a plan, a small contractor does a toolbox meeting mm -hmm. uh, before mm -hmm. going to, to work. Uh, will get a significantly larger reduction in any penalty that they may have as a result of violation uh, based on size and based on commitment. This is an expansion of existing reductions uh, that exist. Uh, we've asked the Congress for more money for the grant program, which I described earlier, that provides free consultation assistance uh, to small business and high hazard industries as a way of getting information to them. I've been trying to work with the insurance industry and with one or two insurers specifically who sell workers' compensation insurance mm -hmm. to try to tap into the market incentives that exist to reduce uh, injury and illness and reduce workers' compensation expense. So I think there are a host of issues. One final thing, if I could uh, point out. We are working with the home builders uh, to write a simplified description of hazards in the home building industry, you know, uh, 10 pages. What are the major hazards that hurt construction workers and what are the what is a simple easy to understand pictures and diagram way that a home builder can comply and then if you follow that guideline you know you're not going to be in any serious uh, problem if there's an OSHA inspection we hope to finish that uh, brochure that pamphlet to this fall and then use the, uh, the association to distribute it to its members so I think there are a lot of things we can do uh, to help small business, help them save money, mm -hmm. help them be competitive, and also to assure that workers are as safe and as healthy as they're entitled to be under the law. Well, let, let me follow up on that, talking about home builders. They're, I'm sure you're, you're aware about the home protection, uh, or the fall protection provisions that right now appear to be in flux. It was at 16 feet. Now there's some talk that it's going to be lowered uh, even, even uh, below 16 feet to a point where uh, some will have to wear harness protection while working on one-story homes. Uh, I know there's a rider to the Labor HHS bill that takes care of that. I'd understood that OSHA was re-examining that. Um, are you uh, interested in going back and possibly uh, changing your opinion on the 16-foot threshold? Or uh, what, what's the status of that right now? Uh, we adopted a change to the fall protection standard involving construction including home building that took effect in February 1995. Uh, it uh, set a standard of fall protection requirements beginning at six feet, not 16 feet. We did so because falls are the leading killer of construction workers. Uh, we've worked in the standard that we adopted at that time to provide flexibility to home builders and to roofers to allow them to identify alternate means of protection. Uh, we've been in further discussion since the standard took effect to uh, clarify what it would take to demonstrate that alternative means, and we're actively discussing that uh, now. Uh, we might be prepared to consider reopening the rule to provide uh, assurance in the regulatory text and the preamble as to how the standard will apply in the home building industry, and as I say, that's a discussion which is uh, continuing at this, uh, at this time. 
I would note that the rider that the House placed on our appropriation for this year not only took the fall protection standard that we changed back to 16 feet, it swept other fall protection standards for openings, stairwells, and, and other things to 16 feet, which was actually worse than what existed before. Uh, so it, it actually would roll back uh, standards well before uh, the time that uh, the uh, that I acted to in increase fall protection. Bottom line here is I think we can uh, work something out that will help prevent falls uh, in, in the construction industry, but which will uh, allow appropriate flexibility for the home builders. And I hope through further discussion we can resolve that without having to resort to uh, congressional appropriations language. All right. Thank you. Thank the thank you, gentlemen. I thank deferred you, my question until the end, and I would like to uh, uh, enable uh, some of our other witnesses to come forward, but I just want to ask you a, 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 a few questions for clarification. First off, an indep independent worker, does do they have to abide by any requirements you have if they're self-employed? No. If someone is um, an independent contractor on a facility, uh, let's just say building a home, uh, they're a roofer, a one or two man operation, and they're both partners. Do they have to abide by any requirements? Uh, sole proprietorships and partnerships uh, do not define an employment relationship, which would bring that uh, activity under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Does does having unclassified workers, um, misclassified workers, present a challenge to you in OSHA? That has not arisen uh, during my time with uh, federal OSHA. I administered a state plan before I came here, and I have experienced uh, that issue, whether or not there was an employment relationship which would uh, create uh, an obligation uh, to provide, to comply with OSHA standards. You have extraordinary rulemaking powers, um, and then you have the basic enforcement of that. Um, uh, is that is that fair to look at those two as your primary responsibility? Is there another responsibility I should insert in there? Education, training, and recognition okay. are the third part of our to, to help functions. educate employees. It strikes me that that um, first off, I might just parenthetically say, you know, there was a question mark that you know, there's some people wondering what is the intent of this hearing? You know, are we trying to are we trying to uh, to go after OSHA, you know, is the intent to now when there have been budget cuts, uh, is this wise to have you step forward? And I, I just would comment that you are in a very difficult situation of being asked to do more with less, but my sense is the direction you're headed is the direction that most members of Congress would want you to head in, uh, and that is to work on a cooperative basis with employers so they can save lives. Notwithstanding uh, the, the challenge that Mr. Lantos makes, that there are some employers who simply are going to want to cut corners and save dollars and, in the essence, jeopardize their employees. One of the things that's troubled me is that murder in the workplace is basically uh, exempt from any real punishment. I can't think of more than one or two times in 20 years that anyone has been found guilty, um, uh, I can think of very few, let me put it that way, where they've found, been found guilty of murder in the workplace because the test is you have to actually show, under federal statute, you have to show intent to, to harm your employer, employee. And have, have you looked at uh, whether it would be advisable for us to make the standard a little easier? So when someone, for instance, knows that their plant isn't ventilated and knows that they might, in, in the case of what happened in Connecticut and Waterbury, knows that an individual is going to be a night watchman who has no sense of what chemicals are being used and so on, and basically suffocates and dies. I mean, that employee was murdered, in my judgment. But uh, based on our standard that we had to prove intent. Have you looked at this issue of what of, of criminal statutes as it relates to uh, well, Let me tell you a case we recently uh, handled. We got a conviction of an employer in Georgia who operated a, a tank washing uh, company. Uh, the employer had asked for a consultation from the state of Georgia and received it and had purchased equipment for retrieval of workers from confined spaces. Uh, after the consultation, the uh, employer returned the retrieval equipment unopened. Uh, one of his workers subsequently entered a tank, was overcome by fumes, and died. Uh, he was prosecuted by the Department of Justice and found guilty of a gross misdemeanor. He received the maximum penalty under law, a six-month misdemeanor. Gross misdemeanor yeah. in a six-month uh, period in, in jail and a hundred and some odd thousand dollar uh, fine. That's the most we could do under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Uh, last year, we supported legislation which would have created felony penalties. Mm -hmm. It was the provision of the bill which was 
most effectively used by employer opponents of the OSHA reform uh, to scare employers into believing that OSHA would run rampant with a criminal penalty authority and would terrorize the employer community when all we sought to do was to assure in cases when the conduct was so gross and outrageous and so offensive to public decency uh, that appropriate criminal sanctions were necessary. I mean, U.S. attorneys have got a lot of work to do and you bring them a gross misdemeanor case and unless it's a really, really, really good case, they're not going to take it up. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, at peril, uh, offer any member a question if necessary, but I would like to encourage us to go forward. Is there any? Yeah, can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I um, uh, Mr. Souter. attempted to be very polite in the first, and I don't really have a, want to get into debate, but I, I do appreciate the difference between how you've answered some of the questions and how some may, people have made assertions, or even in the written testimony, assertions have been made about uh, Congressman Ballinger's bill causing 30,000 more deaths, you in fact said it's likely to increase accidents. That's substantially different than putting a numerical number on and that uh, it should be clear that we shouldn't have fake science masquerade as science, that in fact your own numbers suggest that there is a lack of clarity. We could put together a chart. There's a nearly perfect correlation that suggests that whatever industry you've been successful in, in lowering the abuse in, there's been a decline in jobs, and therefore OSHA is causing a decline in jobs. You, could, you can do a lot of things with charts uh, that may not be representative. I think that we can argue about the merits of a bill. Uh, this is like having a, a public discussion over what a tolerance an axle should have in a car or a tolerance of what they should have in a tire because certainly there's going to be failures and it's very difficult without making uh, those of us who believe that there should be reform which uh, benefits the Americans workers with those of us who believe that your voluntary compliance efforts are worthwhile and Cass Ballinger's bill does a lot of that uh, are somehow being held personally liable for every death or every injury that occurs. 62 percent are transportation homicide or suicide which OSHA has very little uh, to do with. I uh, commend your efforts to reform the agency. I commend, quite frankly, in personal response to your question, to questions, your carefulness in not doing that. I hope other members of Congress are also careful with specific data and uh, in your testimony that you'd be a little more cautious about the uh, nature of the claims, even though you're trying to defend your agency. Uh, well, I, of course, stand by my testimony and be happy to go into the numbers uh, uh, at any time. Uh, but I, I must say, Mr. Chairman, how much I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come to the committee and talk about the management of a government agency and how to make it more effective. Uh, mm -hmm. It hasn't happened in my two years here. And this, this is what really counts to the American people. I think they expect us to get our act together, to get government and business and labor working together to solve their real problems. And being hurt or killed or permanently made sick on the job is a real problem for people. And uh, I think we can do a lot. And I appreciate this opportunity to describe how we're working on that. Well, you, you have a very difficult job. And uh, you, I've been noticing that you can get, get it from both sides. Uh, and I think you've been a wonderful witness. I have tremendous admiration for the job you're doing. And uh, I just want to encourage you to keep doing it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, definitely, Mr. In, Green. In briefly, and in, in I, my I, colleague. I, I knew that might, uh, uh, <laughs> I knew my, Mr. Souter's <laughs> comments might bring a, a comment on the other side. Well, and welcome Mr. Souter, I appreciate his comment about using statistics, particularly in your, in your statement. And here, the 62 percent was transportation, homicide, or whatever. I'd like to see those numbers uh, validated also. But not now. And, uh, but not now. <laughs> but, but anyway, I think well, there are differences of opinion, but I think you're heading in the right direction because of a lot of our frustration with, the, uh, with OSHA and sometimes government in general. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you very much for coming. And I would at this time and ask them to remain standing. And they'll speak in this order, Cornelia Blanchett, uh, Lee Ann Elliott, and Glenn Rondo uh, in, in that order. Uh, this is our second panel. And uh, if you would remain standing. Boy, did I make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> You're so quiet. It's awesome. <laughs> Hi. Charlie Jessica. We have, excuse me, yeah. I'm a little, let me see, four names. Here. Rondo, Hamilton, Elliot, Blanchett. What's that? Oh, oh. Do you have one? Elliot? Me and Elliot? Perfect.
Are we missing a witness? Uh, what? Before I see two, I have three witnesses. So we, do we not have a Glenn Rondo? Yes, Glenn Rondo. Yes, no, Glenn, uh, if, are you Glenn? Yes. And you'll be joined by someone else? Yes. Uh, but you'll be testifying, correct? Uh, and Mr. Okay. I'm sorry, this is uh, James Hamilton. Yes. Yeah, uh, but both of you will be giving testimony or one? What? Okay, uh, uh, fine. I'm sorry, if you raise your right hand, uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, for the record, I note that all our witnesses have uh, responded in the affirmative. I, I'm sorry that we, yeah, please, please come up. Mr. Hamilton, you're in the, in the middle there. And um, please feel free to, What, could I ask you to identify yourself for the record? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I'm Charlie Jezik. I'm the Assistant Director for Education and Employment with the General Accounting Office. Thank I'm you, Charlie. And it's, it's, nice, Mr. Jezik, it's nice to have you here. And please feel free to come forward. I'm going to be uh, a little more strict, uh, even though we have less members here now, uh, on uh, testimonies, given that we have a number to testify here. And uh, we'll start with our first witness, um, uh, Ms. Blanchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we are pleased to be here today to assist the subcommittee as it looks for ways to help OSHA determine how it should fulfill its role in ensuring American workers safe and healthful workplaces. Since its creation 25 years ago, OSHA has made significant progress in achieving its mission. Today, I would like to comment on how employer and employee representatives view OSHA's mission and its accomplishment of that mission, as well as how OSHA can enhance its efforts. My discussion is based on work we have done over several years. Our work suggests that although OSHA has accomplished much during its fairly short history, its approaches to regulating workplace safety and health have sometimes been ineffective and frustrating for both employers and workers. What is needed, according to employer and employee representatives we spoke with, is a greater service orientation. This means improved communication with business and labor, including making information more accessible and enhanced cooperation with employers and workers throughout the regulatory process. To its credit, OSHA has begun to take some positive steps to change its enforcement approach. Last year, we reported on employer and employee experiences with federal workplace regulations, including occupational safety and health standards. We found that both employer and employee representatives generally supported OSHA's mission, as well as its general regulatory effort to implement that mission. However, the agency's enforcement strategies do not always appear well suited to the demands and challenges of today's work world. In our study of workplace regulation, we found that the employer and employee representatives we interviewed generally believed that one, communication between OSHA and firms and unions is poor and OSHA does not always provide the accurate and complete information that firms and unions need to comply with OSHA's requirements. Two, OSHA relies on an adversarial, rigid, gotcha approach rather than a more collaborative enforcement strategy. And three, <coughs> three standards enforcement is unfair and inconsistent, in part due to staff's lack of knowledge of regulations and how those regulations apply to specific business or industry operations. Given these perceptions about OSHA, it is not surprising that many employer and employee representatives believe OSHA needs to take a critical look at the way it operates. Many suggested that OSHA could foster greater compliance by increasing the amount of technical assistance it provides and better educating workers and employers about their rights and responsibilities. Some employers also suggest expanding OSHA's consultation assistance and expanding outside attendance at OSHA's training institute. Some employers and union officials we talked to also identified a need for more and better trained staff. However, given current budgetary realities and the large number of employers, this approach has severe limitations. We believe that other regulatory approaches that place greater responsibility on workers and employers for maintaining safe and healthful workplaces show greater promise. 
As you can see from the suggestions that involve increasing or expanding existing services, OSHA has already taken some steps to be more service oriented. One existing OSHA activity that appears to have enjoyed employer support is the Voluntary Protection Program. Employers we interviewed supported an expansion of this program. Other examples of positive initiatives include the May 200 program and a pilot project aimed at the expeditious abatement of work workplace hazards in return for a reduction in penalties. In summary, there's a general consensus among both the employer and employee representatives we spoke to that OSHA continues to play an important role in providing for the safety and health of American workers. Although OSHA, OSHA appears to be moving in the right direction, it is too early to fully assess the impact of the agency's actions. In the interim, OSHA should be encouraged to continue its experimentation with new regulatory strategies that improve its service, service orientation and foster a less adversarial regulatory climate while not jeopardizing the safety and health of America's workers. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement, and I will be happy to answer any questions you or the members of the subcommittee might have. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Elliott. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Leanne Elliott, and I am the Executive Director of the Voluntary Protection Programs Participants Association. I want to thank Chairman Shays and this committee for the opportunity to discuss with you the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and OSHA's Voluntary Protection Programs, positive impact that they have on improving and promoting worker safety and health across this nation. The VPPPA commends OSHA Assistant Secretary Joe Deere for his vision in recognizing the role and value of cooperative programs, including the VPP, within the agency's efforts to assure worker safety and health. Through the development of programs which encourage and recognize employers and foster partnerships between the government and industry, the agency has adopted a more balanced approach, utilizing cooperative programs in conjunction with its more traditional enforcement efforts. Under Mr. Deere's leadership, the number of sites participating in the VPP has more than doubled to its current level of over 230 facilities across the nation. Additionally, under his direction, VPP participants and OSHA have become true partners in reinventing government. This effort was recognized this past month by Vice President Al Gore. Mr. Gore presented the administration's highest honor in its reinventing government program, the Hammer Award, to both the VPPPA and OSHA's VPP division for their contributions in providing a government that works better and costs less. The VPP are an outstanding example of how OSHA has developed partnerships with industry to encourage and recognize excellence and create models from which others can learn. Participation in the VPP fosters cooperation among labor management and the government. This partnership, one of the most frequently cited benefits of VPP participation, results from the facility's desire to go beyond mere compliance and OSHA's willingness to work with the site to enhance its safety and health performance. Additionally, management commitment and meaningful employee involvement promote internal cooperation between these groups and are fundamental to participation in the VPP. The VPP process shows results. VPP sites demonstrate the benefits of proactive approaches to managing worker safety and health. These benefits include lost workday rates that are 60 percent lower overall than the industry average, reduced workers' compensation cost, increased productivity, reduced absenteeism, and a cooperative relationship with the government. In addition to these benefits, VPP sites are recognized as proactive leaders in assuring worker safety and health. All of these benefits combine to further enhance VPP participants' competitiveness in the global market. An example of these results can be seen in the success of Mobile Corporation. During the three-year period that Mobile brought all of its chemical facilities into the VPP, recordable injuries fell by 32 percent. Lost workday incidents declined by 39 percent. These reductions translated into financial savings of over $1.6 million. Mobile's Joliet Refinery in Illinois reported workers' compensation costs of $300,000 in 1989 when it began the VPP application process. When the site was approved to the VPP in 1991, its workers' compensation costs had declined by 89 percent to $34,000. Absenteeism has dropped by 25 percent and the refinery's throughput has continued to exceed predictions. The plant also extended the VPP concepts to its waste minimization effort and has reduced waste outhaul by more than 50 percent. Another VPP site 
Wood Pro Cabinetry in Kabul, Missouri is a small business with 100 employees. In 1992, before VPP participation, Wood Pro Cabinetry had a lost time recordable rate of 22.4. The facility was accepted into the VPP this past year and currently has a year-to-date lost time recordable rate of 2. The positive effects of the VPP reach well beyond the facilities that are participating in the programs. A survey conducted earlier this year by our organization to measure the impact on worker safety and health that the VPPPA and VPP sites have across the nation indicated that more than three quarters of a million employees have been reached. Since this survey only included responses from one fourth of the VPP sites currently participating, the numbers of employees actually impacted, we believe, is much greater. OSHA also benefits greatly from its participation and involvement with the VPP. Agency representatives observe best practices in safety and health, which they can then share with others as models and use in the development of more effective standards and policies. As an example of this partnership, the VPPPA members and OSHA recently teamed together to train every OSHA field employee in safety and health program evaluation. This training initiative was an integral part of OSHA's own internal safety and health program. During this time of leveraging, of reinventing government and redesigning government agencies, VPP sites have taken a proactive approach to working with OSHA to leverage its limited resources. VPP sites and OSHA have developed several cooperative efforts as a result of this partnership, including the VPPPA mentoring program, the special government employee program, pro bono assistance to small businesses, and training initiatives. The results of the VPP that I have shared with you today have been achieved at a cost to the agency of only six-tenths of one percent of its annual budget for 1995. With more resources devoted to these efforts, the positive impact on worker safety and health could be even greater. The VPP demonstrate the dramatic success of the power of partnerships between government and industry. The programs have had a profound impact on worker safety and health and play a crucial role in OSHA's reinvention effort and ability to achieve its mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Glenn Rondo. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, men members of the subcommittee. My name is Glenn Rondo, uh, Manager of Safety Services for Great Northern Paper, located in Northern Maine. Joining me on my left is Jim Hamilton, President of Local 485, United Association of Journeymen and Apprentices of the Plumbing and Pipe Fitting Industry of the United States and Canada, and who is a fellow employee at Great Northern. We are deeply honored to be invited to speak before this committee and discuss an innovative worker safety program that was the first of its type in the United States and involved the courage and trust of our company, our unions, and OSHA. Our testimony before you is aimed at describing how a prescription for safety was developed within a company that suffered from the pressures of downsizing, hostile takeovers, and a rapidly changing economic climate. Great Northern Paper is almost 100 years old. It is comprised of two potent paper mills, a sawmill, the largest private hydro system in the United States, and just over 2 million acres of land in the state of Maine. Through the years, its success was legendary throughout the potent paper industry. It was widely known for its quality paper products and dedicated workforce, employing over 4,200 workers in the early 80s. It was at this time that the company began to undergo change. Great Northern's parent company began diverting capital for expansion to other states where opportunity was perceived to be better. The two mills in Maine began to age. Pressure to reduce costs led to wave after wave of reductions in the workforce. Great Northern's parent company was a victim of a hostile takeover in 1990. The new parent company shopped off Great Northern selling the main operations to Bullwater Incorporated at the start of 1992. To employees, it was the third owner in three years, and employment that had been over 4,000 eight years earlier had already dropped to 2,000, with more layoffs on the way. Morale was poor among both union and salaried workers who perceived an uncertain future. At the time, Bullwater purchased Great Northern in 1992, a union president filed a complaint with OSHA that a previous safety condition brought to the attention of Great Northern 10 years earlier had not been addressed. The complaint was more a cry for help 
than to cripple the company. Through all the turmoil of the 80s and early 90s, safety had suffered and with it, trust. The union president, who has since retired, wanted, along with the other unions, not to bring the new owners of the company to its knees, but to have OSHA motivate us. Bullwater had purchased Great Northern for the long term. It wanted to invest in its new properties and its workforce without having to be fined for a violation it knew nothing about. It became clear to OSHA, the unions, and to Bullwater that the typical wall-to-wall -wall inspection was not the preferred path. Here was an opportunity to try something new that would correct safety deficiencies and help restore cooperation and trust with all concerned. OSHA was looking for an employer who was willing to form a unique partnership with the federal agency and with organized labor. The old carrot and the stick approach needed to be changed. Great Northern Paper was a perfect setting for the experiment. OSHA, our unions, and representatives of the company sat down in 1992 and formulated a local emphasis program, or LEP 200, now known as the Main 200 program. The goal was simple, bring all of our facilities into safety compliance. We developed a force that at one time exceeded over 150 to 160 people who were divided into teams that searched for problems and then fixed them. Every inch of our vast facilities were inspected. Every item identified as a potential or real safety problem was tracked by a complex computerized tracking system to assure the item was corrected. Progress reports were given to OSHA. This year, we expect the entire program will be completed. Our employees have identified nearly 30,000 different items, and we are on target to correct all of them. The cost to date has gone over $32 million. At one point, we were spending about $250,000 per week. The value of this unique LEP 200 program has gone far beyond improving safety. It has become the foundation of a new relationship between Great Northern, its union, unions, and OSHA. Our employees and management will soon apply for OSHA's voluntary protection program with the expectation of becoming, if not the first, among the first in the potent paper companies in the state of Maine to achieve that status. The LEP 200 experience has shown us all that we have a cooperative partnership with OSHA instead of the adversarial relationships of the past. Most importantly, safety has been established as a continuing high priority item by all involved. This unique program has benefited Great Northern with its unions and our experience and success in involving them with the LEP 200 effort was a blueprint for dealing with other issues. After the LEP 200 program was established, we received the cooperation of our unions in finding ways to reduce our operating costs by millions of dollars. Our employees are now leading the way at developing goals and a mission for our company. They are redefining how maintenance of our mills should be carried out. Our employees are now actively involved in plying the future of Great Northern Paper. This summer, this new spirit of cooperation and trust that began with OSHA's encouragement was best demonstrated when the company and the unions quickly and peacefully inked new six-year labor agreements. At this point, my colleague Jim Hamilton has a very brief statement on behalf of the unions at Great Northern Paper, and then we would be honored to answer any questions you or others on the subcommittee may have. Jim? Thank you. Let me just say, Mr. Hamilton, I'm sorry I didn't recognize that, of course, you are on my program to give a, t a testimony, and I appreciate you being here. I realize that you are co-partners in this effort, and uh, we'll be asking questions of you just as we will the others here. And thank you for being here. You have thank a Mr. Chase. Well, I'm very honored to be here, and my statement, uh, all 14 union presidents at Great Northern have reviewed and concur with the statement you have just heard. An attachment of our signatures accompanies the document of testimony depicting the actual events and reflects the cooperative effort of 
which all have been involved. This includes OSHA, Great Northern Paper Company, Bowater Incorporated, the unions, employees, and management. And Mr. Chase, if you'll allow me time, it's very short. I'd like to read this into the record. You, you may, definitely. Thank you very much, sir. Honorable Christopher Shays and distinguished members, we, the undersigned 14 union presidents, have read the attached document of testimony to be presented by Mr. Glenn Rondow and Mr. James Hamilton on October 17, 1995. We are in agreement and have indicated by our signatures the attached document of testimony in good faith depicts not only the actual events historically, that it is accurate testimony which embodies and reflects the cooperative effort of which all have been involved, namely OSHA, the company, Great Northern Paper Company, Bullwater Incorporated with operations in Millinocket, East Millinocket and Ashland, Maine, to include all employees, union and management. And uh, I'd like to present this copy to you of the original signatures in this committee and thank you very much. I, I thank all of you very much. And um, let me say that um, I think OSHA is in a very difficult situation now. It has uh, uh, a number of very strong critics. It has, uh, um, but it also has an extraordinary important role to play. And uh, the testimony as it is evolved, I mean, I almost feel like I'm in church. I'm, I feel like saying right on, you know, praise the Lord. Um, you know, we want government to work. And the message that I'm getting from GAO is that OSHA must use a more cooperative approach to leverage the limited OSHA assets uh, and resources that it has available to it. Um, I'm, I'm hearing of the uh, incredible program of the v PPPA as you described it, uh, Ms. Elliott, in terms of your efforts throughout the country. Um, I'm hearing from uh, a pilot uh, program. Uh, I, I gather um, Bowater Great Northern Paper Company is part of, of, I have to be sure whether it's part of the VPP program, uh, if it's uh, part of the main two, 200 program, I, I need to have that kind of fit in. But I, but, but what I'm getting is that uh, if you can get the employers and the employees to sit down together and you have a cooperative regulatory body allowing that to happen, that you can get extraordinary results. And um, I just really want to make sure that message gets out. Could you just explain to me, um, are you part of the VPPA? Are you part of the VPP program? Are you part of <laughs> Main 200? I mean, how does it all fit in? Okay, it, it's our goal to become part of the VPP. Okay. Uh, we are the P200 program. Uh, the P200 program started with our facilities, our company, our unions, and our management. In Maine? In Maine. Yes. We were the first, uh, the pilot ship, uh, whatever term you want to use. And, and what I'm gathering from, from your description is that you were having extraordinary problems at your plant. Uh, obviously, this was a plant that one of the plants you bought into. Uh, in yes, Bowater purchased the the main division, uh, which in, again includes two paper mills, uh, a very large sawmill. At one time, had 300 employees. That sawmill now has 123. Uh, the world's largest private uh, hydroelectric system, over two million acres of uh, timberlands, uh, a woodlands operation that had to be downsized. And when you downsize, as uh, Mr. Deere said earlier, it has a ripple effect. Uh, not only do you lose the people that actually go out the door, but then when all the domino effect takes place, uh, you have uh, a lot of people doing jobs that they're not familiar with and, and so on. And uh, during all this time, we had, we had our challenges. And, uh, let, me, let me ask uh, you, Mr. Hamilton, from your perspective, when um, uh, were, are you associated with the main plant? Uh, yes, I Maine? am, sir. Uh, was, um, was your concern at first that, you know, what would Bowater do with it? Were you concerned it might be shut down? Were you concerned that this effort of joint effort was, uh, uh, was not going to bear fruit? I mean, if you could give me a sense of the, of the attitude at the time. Um, were you hopeful? I mean, how would you describe the, was it a slow process? Fill me in. I think that it... Could you talk a little closer to the mic? I'm going to ask you to bring that mic a little closer. And the one that amplifies is the one that's in silver. 
So if you, so I think because of there was some skepticism, sir, and okay. just turn the mic a little to your side. Is that mic on? Did you just hit this? Okay, yeah. Talk into that mic there. Please. I think there was some skepticism in the beginning, sir, okay. and that people, because of the ownership changes and uh, just the uh, feeling of the employees, uh, but that that turned around. That that the participative uh, cooperation of everybody after the programs got rolling and uh, took effect and people became involved and took ownership in it and uh, could see the benefits in it that it, it's, it's paid many dividends beyond just the safety. That, uh, well, you know, I, I, um, I was tempted to ask what's the problem with this program, but I obviously don't have the right witnesses for that one. But what would be what would be the potential down for, uh, negative of a program like this? I'm, I mean, let me ask J.O., is there any, uh, you've heard the testimony and so on, and you've been following this, and uh, uh, are you hopeful that this kind of program can be expanded uh, well beyond its present scope now? And now you're talking about the main 200 or yeah, the, the main VPP? 200. Main 200. Well, do, you know what? Do me a favor. Define the difference. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, the main 200 program, uh, its participants are the 200 right. firms in Maine that has the highest number of injuries. And it's a, it's a voluntary program, as is the VPP. Um, the idea was that companies, those two, among those 200, the right. firms that were willing to cooperate, that they would uh, do an assessment of their own workplaces, their own work sites, and they would come up with their own action plan for correcting <coughs> any deficiencies. And as a result of that, uh, they would uh, receive, they would not be on the, I guess, the number one list in terms of uh, inspections. Uh, I believe that's correct. If, mm -hmm. if I'm incorrect, <laughs> correct me, please. Uh, the VPP is a um, program whereby outstanding, I guess we could use that term, companies, firms, that have outstanding workplace safety and health programs of their own, and that beyond their own programs and their own uh, outstanding safety record, they're willing to reach out to other companies mm -hmm. and uh, share their successes and but encourage in, other companies. In both instances, and I'll, mm -hmm. yield not, uh, I'll give the floor to Mr. Souter, but in both instances, there's a, a very definite cooperation between Absolutely. three parties. Uh, the employer, the employee, and the regulatory um, body, the lawmaking authority, and, the, and also the regulatory authority. Absolutely. Okay. Can Mr. Sauter? Yeah, yeah, yes. I just interject one thing with yes, the definitely. employee involvement component that it is a very crucial part for VPP participation that there is meaningful employee involvement at the facility in addition to the management commitment. Mm -hmm. And for facilities that have collective bargaining agents present, it is a requirement that the representatives from that local collective bargaining agent turn in a signed statement to the agency stating that they do not oppose the facility's participation in the VPP. And at any time during their participation in the VPP, the union has the, the right to inform OSHA that they no longer support the program and they will then withdraw from the program. So it is a definite partnership among OSHA, the employees, and the management at the site. Mm -hmm. Can I just make an observation that, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rondo, you, your, your plan obviously spent a lot of money in a sense to, to comply, but it probably spent it in the most effective ways. And, uh, yes, yeah. yes, we did. And, uh, Mr. Souter. And I'll try to reasonably behave so Mr. the chairman does not start singing the Hank Williams Jr. song, All My Rowdy Friends Tonight. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, and I want to say up front, too, that I believe that businesses that carelessly uh, put their employees at risk are not only a shame, that is, they're morally incorrect, but they're stupid uh, financially. And it's really good to see efforts such as yours that uh, are trying to uh, address those type of things. But I wanted to ask first, uh, Ms. Blanchett, uh, this question. We just heard from Mr. Deere um, and, uh, about his efforts to change the agency and you saying at the end of your testimony trying to change the agency. But we also heard about the six-foot rule, which basically would take Mr. Scarborough, presumably have to wear a harness in case he fell down. That's how, how legends are created by OSHA to say that six feet is a danger. Uh, do you believe that they adequately consulted with people? Are you familiar with that rule? And does that not seem like the type of thing that just sends businessmen up a wall when they hear something like uh, uh, Michael Jordan falling over is a danger? 
I, I am not familiar with that rule, and I'll give Mr. Jessica a chance to answer because he's worked in this area a lot longer than I have. Uh, I will say that there are a number of regulations that uh, OSHA itself recognizes as being duplicative or in need of revision for some other reason and is in the process currently of, of revising reg regulations and eliminating regulations. I can't uh, talk specifically about this one, but uh, I, and I can understand that how such a rule would uh, evoke that kind of reaction. In the work we did on workplace regulation and the people we talked to, we, we got similar reactions to specific instances of standards that they saw as unreasonable. As you, um, I think Mr. Deer in his testimony had one reference that uh, one of the voluntary compliance companies that they went through had uh, so many more times uh, they expected, uh, I guess the two people that weren't in the main program had 14 times more uh, uh, violations than uh, would have been normally expected. You said that there were 30,000 things that you were working uh, through, I think, uh, in the process. Uh, and I want to come back to, in your GAO study, um, given the fact that they had 30,000 violations uh, that or things that they potentially could work through. Do you think most businesses look at the OSHA law as something that they're going to try to voluntarily work with, unless they're in one of the programs? Or do they just kind of wait for their visit coming in the once every 60 years or 20 years or whatever it is, uh, fearing and knowing that when OSHA comes, there's going to be a slam, but more or less giving up when they look at the uh, I mean, you'd need multiple attorneys just to figure out first the OSHA law, then the labor law, then the fair employment standards law, and all the, the uh, EPA laws. It, as a businessman, is it not true, I'll phrase it that way, that most businesses more or less sit and wait till the enforcement comes? I, I really can't speak for most businesses other than to say, as, as you did in your introduction to the questions, it only makes sense from a business person's point of view to protect its workers. And it's also the morally right thing to do. So I, I certainly would not say that there are businesses in, in great numbers doing whatever it is they feel like doing and thinking that they're safe because OSHA is only going to be there every 60 years. But at the same time, I'm sure there are some firms that fall in that category as well. Uh, in terms of the multiple standards and the multiple violations that go along with the standards, uh, currently OSHA is trying through um, it's changing it, more negotiated rulemaking to, to bring about a consensus before standards are actually officially proposed, and, and that will probably help in that regard. Also, as I understand each of these programs, a major part of it is prioritizing <coughs> what it is the company's going to deal with. So in the case of 30,000 problems, I mean, obviously, they couldn't address all of those, so there would be some mechanism for prioritizing the problems. And I'll, if I may, I'll uh, let Mr. Jessick comment maybe on the previous question as well as this one. Uh, yeah, Charlie Jessick. Um, in our study, it's not a nationally representative study, but it was a study of 20, an in-depth case study of 24 employers <laughs> and 12 unions, and, and including two non-union employee committees. And we worked very closely with, with national organizations like the AFL-CIO, as well as the Labor Policy Association and NAM, and constantly bounced off of them the kinds of things we were hearing to see whether it made sense. And with re regard to your question, one of the things that really came up was uh, employers especially felt that there, there was a real need for knowledge, a real need for information. A lot of employers uh, wanted to do the right thing uh, that we talked to, especially the smaller ones, but they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to get information. And, uh, this, uh, and it did create a, uh, contribute to some extent an, an element of fear. I mean, they didn't know a lot about OSHA. Some employers, uh, in another study, we found a lot of employers never had any experience with OSHA, and, and most of what they've heard about OSHA was hearsay. So does this, it does contribute to this climate of fear. And, and the thing that came again and again was that they wanted information. They wanted to know what they had to do. And in many instances, it was difficult for them to get that information. I'd, I'd just like to close with this comment, and that is, is that I believe, too, that we've seen exemplary programs and that I believe in Congressman Ballinger's bill, he's attempting to boost that portion and instead of the enforcement that we focus more on, on uh, shared programs where we provide the information and that as we look at 
um, what businesses are, uh, from what we heard from Ms. Elliott's testimony, that in fact companies make more money when they do a number of these things. And what we should be doing is encouraging the chamber and uh, uh, even if it's, it's OSHA, rather than have so many people in the field to hold regional seminars on how to, how to comply, how to be effective, to show how that can help a business, much as Michael Porter in the Harvard Business Review wrote in the issue before last about how environmental regulation changes can actually save money for businesses. But there's this kind of fear hanging over the head that I believe leads a lot of businesses right now to have, as you pointed out in your report, a hostile attitude towards agencies. Therefore, they're not even looking at the financial gain. They're more or less sitting back and waiting uh, for fear of what's going to happen. And the team concept that we're, we're pushing through is really the way capitalism should work. And that's really what you've done in Maine, is to have the company and the employees sit down together and work it like should have been done in all industry in this country rather than the adversarial relationship. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the, as I'm learning about this reinvent plan, Maine 200 is where, like, companies in Maine that had the worst safety record were, were called together and, and, and told, you will either cooperate or else we're going to lower the boom with incredible sanctions from OSHA. Therefore, what alternative do they have? So they said, sure, we'll cooperate. And, and then that's how this has worked out. I wanted to ask you to get to the bottom line. Do you see, as we work toward reinvent, and of course the promise that you're going to have, uh, what was it, 16,000 regulations are going to be eliminated, um, and maybe clarification of regulations, which is something I hear a lot about. People can't even understand what these regulations are in order to enforce them. Do you see a congressional role in this? I mean, do you think that this reinvent process will just proceed by itself that way? Or do you see a role for Congress in this? Uh, uh, and any or all of you, briefly, thank you. Well, <clears throat> I can only speak to the experience we've had in the uh, P200 program. Uh, it has been a true partnership. Uh, we needed some guidance. Um, OSHA needed some guidance. And we, we got that guidance by working together. And the, the reforms and all that, I don't think are really needed. Mm -hmm. I think if a, the shackles were taken off of OSHA so they could have more of this cooperative effort and be the consultants and help the employers that want to be helped, that those employers will help ourselves. And that leaves, as Mr. Deer said, the leveraging that they can allocate the you know, the, the small resources that they really have towards going after those who don't want to help themselves. Do you think sometimes you have an overabundance of faith? Well, faith is uh, through motivation. And in the P200 program, there is motivation. Uh, we were given the choice. Uh, we could have allowed OSHA to come in. It would have been a lot cheaper to let OSHA come in and do an inspection and see what they see and cite us and mm -hmm. walk away and not do any more. But in the long run, that would have been the most expensive route for us to take because through our efforts, our employees uncovered many, many, many real hazards that OSHA inspectors don't see, electrical hazards. Mm -hmm. For an example, 67% at one mill, 48% uh, of the hazards we uncovered at another mill were electrical. And ocean inspections don't Wouldn't traditionally don't uncover electrical mm -hmm. hazards. But those are the kind of hazards that kill people. Mm -hmm. You may never get involved in them. But when you do, you don't get a second chance. That, a very positive uh, result. Ms. Elliott, would you agree? Yes, I would like to say um, two comments on that. The first one has to do with a comment I made early in my testimony about the need for a balanced approach, utilizing cooperative programs along with firm and fair enforcement for those employers, like Mr. Deere talked about earlier, that are not the ones who are interested in pursuing a cooperative relationship. Unfortunately, there are work sites out there where the employers do not have as important regard for their worker safety and health as, as we would hope. And the cooperative programs are an important part of the balance, but you need to have the, the balance be for both sides. Mm -hmm. The other part of it extends from the comments that 
that the gentleman here just made about how Congress measures OSHA's performance. And Mr. Deere also mentioned that earlier, as far as measuring them on enforcement inspections and citations issued versus overall impact on improving worker safety and health. Certainly the VPP and the Maine 200 experience that we've heard have had a tremendous impact on worker safety and health that are very valuable to the agency. And encouraging that sort of a measurement is what is the overall impact on improving worker safety and health is an important role that, that Congress can play. Mm -hmm. And OSHA's it seems to be working out well, and I would hope other states would look to it. But I, I'm just wondering, in terms of the bottom line, whether there is a role for Congress. I just begin to think maybe there is. GAO, I'm sure you'd like to comment on that. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I can define a concrete role other than, as uh, Ms. Elliott said, to encourage OSHA's efforts to continue experimenting with, experimenting with collaborative efforts and publicizing successes in efforts such as this hearing. Uh, as um, the gentleman from the union said, that initially there was reluctance to cooperate with management in this new program. And I think there is a, a lot of still natural tendencies to, for management and labor to mistrust one another and for the business sector to mistrust the federal regulatory sector. And so the more is known about successes, uh, the more collaborative efforts will, will be undertaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fine. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a comment oh. that yes, Mr. Hamilton. I think it's very important uh, OSHA's presence in the United States with the workers in this country and the people that you represent, all of you, that I think you'll play a very important role and I think the funding is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I, I'm not looking for uh, many or long answers. I just want to know, does the voluntary program Mo focus mostly on larger businesses, or is it, uh, I, I'll ask you, Ms. Ms. Elliott, is it mostly larger businesses that are the uh, current invited number to participate? In the current participants, which are in federal and state OSHA jurisdiction 231, a majority of the employers would fall under probably what most people would think of as larger businesses. There are small businesses like Wood Pro Cabinetry that I referred to in my testimony and others that are involved in the programs. One of our organization's emphasis in the coming years is to expand and work with OSHA on encouraging more small businesses to get into the voluntary protection program, be it through our mentoring program and through outreach and assistance to encourage them not only in improving worker safety and health in their facilities, but also encouraging them to get to the level of excellence that VPP requires. Let me say that I, I found all of your testimony um, very helpful and also very encouraging. And uh, I also want to thank uh, you and the GAO for the good work it has done uh, in the past and the continued good work. And the fact that I appreciate you sharing the, uh, uh, the floor, so to speak, uh, with others as well. So um, thank you all for coming to, uh, to Washington and for testifying. It's been very interesting. We will uh, conclude with our third panel, William Steinmetz, Jr., Safety and Loss Control Manager, Midland Engineering Company, uh, and also Michael J. Wright, um, Director of Health, Safety, and Environment, United Steelworkers of America. And if they would both come forward and remain standing. Yeah, that's great. Super. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks for coming down. Do it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Steinmetz, if you just remain standing for a second. As someone who notices ties, I like your tie. <laughs> Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. A note for the record that both our witnesses uh, answered in the affirmative, and uh, we'll start, I, I think, with you, Mr. Steinmetz. Appreciate both of you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I begin, I, I would like to just mention, uh, uh, Congressman Green uh, uh, asked the question of documentation regarding 62% of workplace fatalities being transportation or homicides, and I do have that. Uh, uh, a piece of documentation that documents that, that this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And Mr. Soder, uh, it was your question that, uh, uh, that generated that, and I do have that if you're interested in it. Unfortunately, uh, the Congressman Green has left. Chairman Chase and members of the subcommittee, my name is Bill Steinmetz. 
I'm the safety and loss control manager for the Midland Engineering Company. We are roofing and sheet metal contractors from South Bend, Indiana, and we perform some 600 projects a year throughout the Midwest, including the United Center, the, home of, uh, the new home of the Chicago Bulls and Blackhawks. We receive as many as 10 OSHA inspections per year. I am also a vice president of the National Roofing Contractors Association, NRCA, and I appreciate being able to comment on the need to re reform the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and applaud the subcommittee for holding a hearing on this issue. NRCA supports the Safety and Health Improvement Regulatory Reform Act of 1995, H.R. 1834, introduced by Representative Cass Ballinger, and we understand that it now has 148 co-sponsors. In addition to our support of H.R. 1834, NRCA is also a member of the Coalition on Occupational Safety and Health, COSH, which consists of more than 400 companies, associations, and professional societies that represent all sectors of business, large and small, in America. Given the administration's call for a new OSHA, neither the need for nor the direction of OSHA reform are at issue. As to the means for achieving reform, the employer community believes that it can best be accomplished by legislative change. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like my written statement placed into the hearing record, and I will now summarize my comments beginning on page five. OSHA's attempts to reinvent itself would seem to be the second stage of its response to criticism of its standards and policies. The first stage involved the formation of a rapid response team, or truth squad, to diffuse reports of excessive OSHA regulation. It has been my experience with OSHA's True Squad that it vigorously denies the existence of ridiculous regulations even as the agency quietly modifies them or alters enforcement of them. <coughs> For example, this year the Secretary of Labor and OSHA have consistently denied reports that there is a regulation that prohibits gum chewing while roofing. Yet, on January 13th, a memo from OSHA's Directorate of Compliance Programs to regional administrators instructed inspectors to refrain from issuing citations for gum chewing and roofing. Throughout 1995, OSHA has also repeatedly denied that it issues citations under HASCOM for the use of household products, such as dishwashing detergent. Yet, on March 21st, OSHA issued a memo to regional administrators stating that an enforcement review showed that citations have been issued for materials such as bricks, rebar, lubricating oils, welding rods, and dishwashing detergent. Another example is OSHA's new fall protection standard, which has been in effect since February 6th. It triggers costly and burdensome work practices at heights above six feet and has touched off a firestorm of protest. Despite the fact that workers, management, and even state plan OSHA programs are dissatisfied with the standard, OSHA's Truth Squad portrayed the standard as eminently fair and flexible. Nonetheless, OSHA management has convened a series of meetings with NRCA, and it is NRCA's hope that the fall protection standard can be fixed. Mr. Chairman, this is the fifth time since 1991 that I have testified before Congress on OSHA. On June 22nd of this year, I testified before the Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee. During that hearing, Mr. Deere was asked whether OSHA continues to support legislation from the 103rd Congress, referred to as COSHRA, the Comprehensive Occupational Safety and Health Reform Act. His answer was yes. For those members who were not in the 103rd Congress, COSHRA was, was sponsored by House and Senate Labor Committee Chairman Bill Ford and Ted Kennedy. Since COSHRA takes the opposite approach to OSHA reform from Mr. Ballinger's bill, not to mention statements from the President, it is difficult to understand how OSHA can simultaneously embrace opposing reform ideologies. I applaud the things OSHA has proposed to reinvent themselves. Focus inspections, less emphasis on paperwork, incentive for safe employers. I just haven't seen any evidence of them. In fact, HASCOM continues to be the number one OSHA citation for 1995. Absent the current congressional pressure, I doubt that OSHA would be interested in these reforms at all, 
And so I can only wonder if their reinvention is more appearance than substance. Clearly, the reforms embodied in the Ballinger Bill will ensure that OSHA can be given a new and more effective direction in worker health and safety. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate your concise testimony. And uh, now, Mr. Wright, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any real attempt to understand OSHA has to begin with the actual experience of those OSHA is charged to protect. My union represents about 500,000 of them, and notwithstanding our name, they are in really every segment of the economy. Steel, of course, but also mining, rubber, chemicals, genu manu general manufacturing, health care, services, even public employment. Last year, 35 of our members died in workplace accidents in the U.S., along with more than a dozen supervisors and contractors in plants, in plants we represent. 26 have died so far this year. Not a single one was a homicide. Not a single one was a suicide. There were three transportation-related accidents, but they were things like workers being crushed between rail cars uh, or, or, or seriously injured with a subsequent death um, by a shifting load on a flatbed truck. How many employees are we talking about again, sir, Mr. Wright? You said, how many, uh, you said all your workers. I'm just last, I'm sorry, how many, I, I'm, how many I'm workers do we have total? I'm sorry to interrupt that takes your train of thought. We have about 600,000 uh, in, and you, and you in the U.S. And you to date, starting the beginning of this year, you've had 25 yeah. deaths. We've had 26 so far this yeah. year. We had 35 last year in, in the U.S in the industries that uh, are regulated by OSHA, yeah. which of course is not every industry. All of the accidents were different, um, but there is one statement you can make about all of them, and that is that none of the accidents occurred because OSHA was too strong. Not a single worker died because the government was too tough or inspected too often or assessed too high a penalty or set too many standards or was not sufficiently cooperative with employers. On the contrary, they died because all too often OSHA is too weak, there are too few inspections, there are too many serious but unregulated hazards in American workplaces, and fundamentally because too many employers think they have nothing to fear from OSHA. Many of us in organized labor have criticized some aspects of what OSHA calls its reinvention, but we fully support its stated goals. First, to better protect American workers on the job, and second, but subordinate, to ease the burden of compliance for employers who really want to do a good job. We're working hard on, the re on that reinvention along with uh, employers, safety and health professionals, and of course the agency itself. But I want to make just one simple point this afternoon, and that is that without a strong program of standard setting and enforcement, coupled with an emphasis on worker rights, OSHA reinvention will fail. I've spent most of my career trying to build voluntary cooperative safety and health programs between workers and management. That's my job. That's exactly what the OSHA reinvention seeks to do. But all my experience convinces me that the best incentives for voluntary programs are mandatory standards and vigorous government enforcement. The best way to ensure that the programs work is to include workers and their representatives in their implementation. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the steel industry, up until about 1980, we were losing about six workers a year from carbon monoxide, a very serious hazard in, uh, in primary steel plants. Near the end of 1979, we lost six in a single accident. In 1980, the steel industry sat down with the union in those negotiations, and we crafted a comprehensive agreement on carbon monoxide. It took about a year to implement the engineering changes and other controls, but since that time, two workers have died from CO in plants. That's too, too many. But uh, based on well, the previous, yes, 19, what? between 1980, uh, between the full implementation of the programs in 1981 right. and today, we've lost two. No, we not. were losing six a year. Gotcha. I have a very high regard for our bargaining, power, our bargaining partners in the steel industry. I'd like to think that we would have reached agreement even without the possibility of petitioning OSHA. But I know that at least one company negotiator sold the final agreement to his superiors by saying, if we don't agree to this, we will get an OSHA standard. OSHA provides leverage. The point is there isn't any trade-off between voluntary programs and enforcement. It's not a matter of one or the other. Increased enforcement and voluntary programs will increase also. 
decrease, decrease enforcement and fewer employers will want to establish strong safety and health programs voluntarily. That's not to say that every company would willingly violate the law were it not for OSHA inspections. There are many employers that would do their best to protect workers without OSHA. In fact, there are three broad categories of employers and OSHA needs to handle one each one a little differently. The major effort of the reinvention should be to do just that. First, there are those for whom safety is an important corporate responsibility they strive to honor. We've heard about the Voluntary Protection Program. Secretary Deer, Assistant Secretary Deere has talked about other programs to recognize and support their efforts, and, and we applaud those programs. On the other end of the spectrum are the corporate lawbreakers, for whom safety is a cost to be avoided and workers are expendable. We've heard about how strong enforcement can turn some of those companies around as well. In the middle, I think, is the vast group of employers, and that is the group that cares about safety, that may want to do a good job, but need a little extra guidance and a little extra incentive. There are lots of ways we can provide the guidance. We've talked about consultation programs, rewriting standards in simple English, and other programs. The incentive can be provided by the kind of ideas that Maine 200 represents. We've been a critic of some aspects of Maine 200, and, and some of my criticisms are in the written statement. But I think the important point about Maine 200 and the other <coughs> programs like it, and there are similar programs going on in, in, uh, in New Hampshire and in Wisconsin, somewhat different focus but a similar emphasis, is that um, without the stick of enforcement, those programs will not succeed because they're based on enforcement as the driving force for, for, for voluntary compliance. Targeted employers in Maine are told that they will get a comprehensive inspection if they do not join the program. I submit that relatively few would join it otherwise. Some would, but not all those that need to join it. Indeed, the entire reinvention effort depends on strong standards, vigorous enforcement, and worker rights. Standards written in plain language are useless if there's no incentive to read them. Reducing a penalty for good faith is impossible if there is no penalty to begin with. OSHA will rarely uncover phony paper programs when workers, uh, unless workers feel free to complain to the agency when that's necessary. Too few companies will choose the high road if the low road carries no risk. Brings me to my final point. Most of, most of the OSHA legislation now in Congress, if enacted, would destroy OSHA's reinvention effort. In fact, they would virtually destroy the agency itself and greatly compromise the safety and health of every American worker. H.R. 1834, introduced by Representative Ballinger, would eliminate first instance penalties in most cases. Employers would have little reason to enter into any of the voluntary programs before the first inspection, since that inspection would be a free ride. H.R. 1834 would also repeal the right of a worker to file a confidential complaint and the right of a union to file a complaint at all. Many hazards would go uncorrected since OSHA would never learn of their existence. Of course, the big cuts in OSHA enforcement contemplated in the House budget would reduce correspondingly the incentive for voluntary compliance. Taken together, H.R. 1834 and the Appropriations Bill would make American workplaces much more dangerous and, to put it bluntly, get a lot of American citizens killed. This view is widely shared by safety and health professionals. You'd be surprised how many company safety directors have told me confidentially that without OSHA, top management would not provide nearly as much support for the corporate safety program. Their trade association lobbyists may tell you something different, but in a recent survey by Industrial Safety and Hygiene News, one of the professional magazines uh, for industrial hygienists and safety professionals, almost two-thirds of respondents said that the current anti-regulatory climate in Washington would have an adverse effect on their corporate safety and health programs, almost two-thirds. And that is just the climate. Consider the impact if the bills actually pass. Mr. Chairman, voluntary compliance is essential. Cooperation is the best way to promote safety and health. Done right, OSHA's reinvention effort can facilitate all of those things. But none of it will happen without, a, without strong standard setting, strong enforcement, and worker rights. Thank you. Thank you both very much. As I view um, the challenge that OSHA has, it's not dissimilar to the challenge that we face in, in our environmental laws. The pendulum went so far one way um, and people didn't want to risk bringing it into balance in the past few years. So we let the balance be this way and there's danger, at least from my perspective, that the balance will go too far the other way. And it's just, it's, it's really, uh, I think, unfortunate that people from both sides of the aisle couldn't sit down 
uh, in past years to say, hey, it's gone too far, let's acknowledge that, and then we're already bringing it into compliance. Um, OSHA is legendary in terms of, of extraordinary numbers of examples of foolish regulations and foolish enforcement. They're not just uh, incidental. Um, at the same time, I'm a strong supporter of OSHA. I believe that, uh, I believe that we, we have murder in the workplace today, candidly. I think there are people that know their employees are in danger and they're very negligent, and yet they're able uh, to ignore uh, what is you know, sound business practice. And uh, people die. Um, so when I hear from the second panel the kind of cooperation, I get excited about it. Um, I get the sense from both of you that you come from different directions, which is really important for us to hear. Um, uh, so I would love to have you give me an assessment uh, of what you thought of the presentation of the second panel. Is it too Pollyanna? Is it, am I in a dream world? I mean, I think it, I'll tell you from my standpoint, I think it's the future. And so um, I'd love you both to just uh, comment on that. I'd like to address the uh, voluntary, uh, the VPP programs that OSHA does offer. I think they're wonderful programs. I think you heard good evidence that they're, they're doing wonderful things in the business community. They don't apply to what I do at all. I'm a, I'm, uh, I do 600 projects a year. The VPP program is written, it's site specific. It's a relatively uh, a complicated program. It, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, I don't mean to characterize it as a bad program, but it's not for the type of business I'm in. There really is no incentive program for the type of business I'm in. Um, OSHA, we're in, in uh, negotiations now with OSHA to try and come up with a, uh, a compliance incentive program specifically for the roofing construction industry. Right. Uh, that will, you know, let's add some carrot back to it too, not just all stick. I'm not in favor of taking away all the stick because I don't think that's a good idea either. And I don't think Representative Ballinger's bill does that. But I, I think uh, OSHA, by their own admission, doesn't have the resources to go out and enforce the standards across all industries. So they need voluntary compliance. They need incentives. They need to reward people that are doing the right things. Let me just say, before I ask you to come, Mr. Wright, sure. if someone, if I were working in the administration and I was asked what my thought was about Senator Kennedy's bill, I would probably find a way to, uh, um, if I was in the administration and from their standpoint, given their position in the past, I would probably find a way to delicately uh, go on to... Uh, uh, would try to find a way to accept it as yes, it was there, but uh, not encourage it to be implemented. And I don't, I don't see the administration uh, asking Congress to, to uh, move forward with Senator Kennedy's bill. I guess what I, I guess what I'm driving at candidly is, y you are making a case, and it may be a uh, may be a valid one that, but I don't think so. That that, a lot of what we're seeing in OSHA is is really not from the heart. And um, I, I think we, Mr. Deere deserves a little more credit than that. I do believe it's from his heart. Now, if you're saying it's from other people in the administration, um, the, you know, the jury's still out. Uh, if we in Congress, by the, the monumental changes that are taking place, have helped to encourage them to think in the way they're thinking, uh, more power to them. But, but I, on the, uh, I, I believe that this administration knows that OSHA needs to change. And I believe the fact that they recognize this change uh, through their award process has, has, has been a signal to a lot of people that it's not just intended to be superficial. But they didn't come to that conclusion on their own. And uh, I, my testimony was trying to characterize an agency that's incapable of reforming themselves. Okay. I think without, without uh, codifying this, without I introducing legislation, the next time the, the, uh, uh, climate, the, uh, the uh, political climate changes, we'll be back to square one. You may be right. You may be right. That's a valid point. Mr. Wright, I... I no, it's fine. Yeah. I, um, first, I, I think the changes in OSHA are, are, are very useful, will protect a lot of workers, are enormously overdue. I think OSHA's getting around to correcting some things that, that were really a result of the original act. For example, some of the regulations you've talked about that, that are on the books and, and just don't make sense anymore are regulations that came in in 1970 when the act was passed because Congress said OSHA is not going to be able to get to everything right away given the cumbersome standard setting process. So many industry voluntary standards uh, were simply put on the books. That was really the only way to do it. Now, all of those standards were written by the regulated industries. Many of them are very out of date. 
A lot of them don't make sense anymore, and that's what they're going after. Now, some of the things that we've heard that are, that are, are, are allegedly silly regulations, and, I, and, and, and I'll use the, the gum chewing on a roof one, um, <coughs> make a lot of sense. And let me tell you about that regulation. There is no OSHA regulation that says you can't chew gum while doing a roofing project. There is a regulation that says you can't chew gum while working around asbestos because you ought to be wearing a respirator while working around asbestos. And because we know that if you chew gum, drink water, eat while you are working with highly toxic substances, that some of those things will get into your body through that route. The regulation, so, so essentially what the regulation does is if you're tearing out asbestos shingle on a roof, okay, um, then you can't chew gum. That's very different than saying roofers can't chew gum in general. That was one of the new standards, and we generally support that. Now, OSHA's in its, uh, in its uh, memorandum that was sent out to the field, and I don't have it in front of me, but my understanding is that what the memorandum said was that if the exposures are below the permitted exposure level, then it's all right to chew gum, and I think that makes sense. But characterizing that as a silly regulation is a long way from the truth. Okay. Um, Mr. Souter, I appreciate you being here, and uh, you have the floor. I wanted to um, ask Mr. Steinmetz a question, and possibly this gum chewing example can help me lead into it, and that is, is that is not part of the problem on uh, some of the regulations, um, uh, both the employer and the employee, much like uh, individuals who ride motorcycles who don't want to wear helmets. Um, would you not think that, because I thought that was a good point about the asbestos, um, that, uh, but you can't really have the employer, a roofing company, out checking on the half hour to see whether his employees are, are chewing gum. We need to have some common sense upon the employees as well, that the employer needs to tell the employees uh, the danger with this, uh, but to some degree, Big Brother can't be watching everybody all the time, particularly every 60 years, uh, if that's the amount of enforcement. At the same time, uh, those of us who, uh, it's hard to deny that in the roofing industry, A, it's dangerous. Uh, there are a lot of deaths from falls. Uh, we've had some in, in my district uh, recently. Um, how, can, how would you suggest, uh, since you uh, seem to share a philosophy that I share that I don't believe the federal government is necessarily the way to do it, to have uh, 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 processes that uh, both encourage the companies to be a little more aggressive with their employees because sometimes the employees understand that the companies are kind of winking at violations of law and yet I see many work sites where people don't have hard hats on, where they're not being responsible on the roofs. I know many of my friends who, who build homes and other things behave very irresponsibly on the job uh, on an individual basis and their employer probably doesn't even have the faintest idea. How would you do this uh, if you wouldn't have the uh, threat of, uh, we're always going to have the threat of some enforcement for carelessness, but how would you uh, try to improve safety at the work site if you wouldn't have it be done through OSHA? As you stated earlier, there, there are a number of other factors in play besides just OSHA. Uh, I have my employee morale to worry about, I have productivity to worry about, I have public relations to worry about, I have the cost of my insurance to worry about, I have my ability to compete. is all impacted by health and safety. I take health and safety very seriously. Uh, and I, I don't mean to be cavalier, but OSHA doesn't change my attitude towards health and safety. Um, my safety program has gotten to the point of where it has two components. One is to keep my employees safe, because I have a vested interest in that. The other is to keep OSHA happy. Hascom is a good example. You, you've probably heard, heard the examples of Hascom. I spend an inordinate amount of time hassling with Hascom. <coughs> Hascom is a paper chase to keep OSHA happy. It, 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 it's, it's money I could be better spending, it's money OSHA could be better spending. In 1994, nine of the top 20 citations were for Hascom. You know, we've heard a lot of people talk about how, what OSHA could be doing to save more lives. The Ballinger Bill is going to cost this amount of lives. OSHA's emphasis on Hascom and other paperwork citations is costing lives. That's money that sh they should be spending chasing things that are killing people. Hascom in construction isn't killing people. Falls are killing people. Trenching is killing people. Electrical is killing people. Struck by accidents are killing people. That's the things those should be, should be, should be spending their time on. They're telling us they're now 
you know, they've now come to the conclusion that, that yeah, maybe that, that is where they should be spending their time. I haven't seen any evidence of it. Um, I also, uh, we could get off on a whole number of angles with the uh, materials because while some materials are, are dangerous, other materials are less so. It'll be some of us back the applying laws to Congress to see how we deal with the labor laws and how we deal with all the uh, things such as the ink blotters and the fountain pens having hazardous materials. And you're supposed to file a report if you have fountain pens in your office. We'll see how many members of Congress do that. Uh, that um, uh, Mr. Wright, I had a, a concern uh, because I know that the uh, steel industry and the foundry industry are, uh, I know, realize you represent a lot more than that, but those are very uh, dangerous, particularly in the old-fashioned uh, uh, industry with, before a lot of the productivity came in. Are you suggesting um, that we move to zero tolerance on death and accidents? In other words, okay. part of the way we could get to zero tolerance would be to have all our jobs exported or to have plastics instead of steel and automobiles. There's some kind of a line there. Would you grant between employability, whether it's the Clean Air Act, which overall has helped our country, and the uh, safety acts, which I'm, I'm not going to disagree of saved a lot of lives, but isn't, would you not agree that there's some balance in here that we can't move to, in effect, zero tolerance without making us non-competitive? I think I disagree with the premise. I, the, the, uh we work with a lot of, of very good companies uh, that, that are profitable, provide lots of employment, and have very good safety records. And their policy on safety is zero tolerance. Uh, I, I can recall one safety manager who, who was told by the, the corporation, you know, your goal this year is to have no more, it is, 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 is to bring the fatalities down to three from the six it was the previous year. Worldwide, this was this is a very large company, with operations in, in 20 or 30 countries, and uh, the corporate goal was to bring the six down to three. And he said, "Which three people do you want me to kill?" He said, "That's not my goal. My goal is zero. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a trade-off. At least where we are now in the workplace, there isn't a trade-off in in our local unions and our workplaces anyway." between providing jobs and providing safety. We found that the companies that do the best job providing safety also do the best jobs at keeping the company profitable and providing jobs. Safety, when, when safety goes bad, it's a management failure. And that management failure usually means there's been a management failure across the board. And that's the company we worry about going out of business. So maybe, the, maybe at, at some level, we would reach some academic trade-off. But where we're operating in the workplace now, we can do an awful lot um, to make workplaces enormously safer through cooperative programs, through strong enforcement, through all those things, and, and create jobs in the process. I, I appreciate your comments. It's a really complicated issue because, as we know, with SDI and a lot of the new steel companies that, are, that aren't union, you have a tremendous boost in employment and, and a lot of changes in the market. But I definitely agree the goal should be towards zero tolerance. But I appreciate your answer. Thank you both. I thank both gentlemen for being here today. And uh, uh, let me also thank the staff on both sides of the aisle who make these hearings possible and uh, also our court reporter, Amy Rose who uh, is uh, quietly making sure it's all taken down. So uh, again, I thank everyone, and uh, this journey, uh, hearing is adjourned. It's the, the NACASH committee. I've heard a little bit about it. There's some point when you don't want to go back. The House returns later this morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, and tomorrow, members begin eight hours of debate on Medicare reform. You can see live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN. This week on Book Notes, David Frumkin discusses his recent book, In the Time of the Americans, The Generation That Changed America's Role in the World. Book Notes, Sundays on our companion network.